the best wrestling in the whole world. Oh shit, it's Vince Russo! Oh yeah, you could be king, king, king of these nuts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Our house, Jerry. Straight up, G. Somebody please explain to me how we are giving credibility to Glenn Gilbert. This is BS! This sucks! I've lost my objectivity and I don't give a damn! Welcome everybody to You've Got To Be Kidding Me episode number 25. We are a TNA history podcast that covers TNA one month at a time. This episode we're talking about TNA in the month of May 2004. I'm Garrett Kidney. I'm joined as always by my co-host Liam Jones. Liam, how are you doing today? I am all right. You just ate yourself a nice orange and dark chocolate Kit Kat. I did. With Southern Australian orange. What's the difference between Southern Australian orange and regular orange? It's a little worse than Victorian ones. Oh, wow. Do you actually have like an orange Australia tier list? Um, That was just a joke about South Australia being worse than Victoria. But Ah. coming from a citrus bowl. Mm hmm. I, I obviously do hold a certain amount of respect for the citrus of Victoria. Do you live in an American football stadium? No, you fool. I live in an area that specializes in the growing and export of citrus. Is that why it's called the Citrus Bowl in uh, wherever it is in Florida? Yes, it's a nod to me. <laughs> you and your references. No, just me. Ah. So I'm going to start introducing you as the Citrus Bowl, Liam Jones. Yeah, that's a good name. A solid nickname right there. Yeah. Garrett, I I, um, I watched a movie by myself for the first time today. What? At a cinema complex. You've never done that before? I've never gone to the movies by myself. Oh, it's the best thing when you realize you can go to movies by yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was pretty sweet. It's such a liberating feeling to be like, I don't need to arrange going to a movie with somebody. I can just go see the black phone on like 90 minutes notice. Yeah, that's the good thing about it. You can be like, ooh, are there tickets? Yes, I can go. It's very disappointing though, because there used to be a cinema that was about 25 minutes from me, but then it closed and it has legitimately impacted my life to the for the worse to a dramatic degree. Garrett, my cinema is an eight minute drive from me. <sighs> You see, my nearest cinema is now a a 75-minute walk from me. Maybe I should start walking there. Maybe that's how I'll get my steps in. Mm, Seems smart. What, an eight-minute drive is probably about a half an hour? Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, I go to the cinema by myself all the time. I love it. I'm just like, I'm going to go see a movie. Because there's nothing else I'm going to do tonight, so I might as well just go see a movie. Hmm. Hmm. It's It's a freeing thing. If you're one of those people who has not yet realized the liberation of realizing you can just go to movies by yourself and have a perfectly fine time because it's an activity that involves sitting silently in the dark. It is inherently not a social activity. <laughs> yet we, for some reason, make it one. You can just you can just go. You can just see, like, I just want to see the black phone this week, which is pretty good. Really it's fine. pushing the black phone. As I say, it's pretty good. It's fine. It's not out here yet. It's a pretty standard, normal, decent, nothing special horror movie. That's a an old Blumhouse joint, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those guys, they really be uh, working the system. Making low-budget horror movies that will probably turn out three or four times their budget. Yeah, just give um, creatives like, Hey, here's the money, go make whatever you want, we won't stop you. Then we'll just release it. But also, we're going to give you $15 million. Yeah. And that's it. Make it work. Yeah. Oh, a pittance of $15 million. Given the film you saw probably cost $200 million. Don't get me yes. started on how fucking much films cost. <laughs> One of your least favorite things in the world, how expensive movies are. Ridiculous. Especially when they look like shit. Yeah. We were just talking about that today, actually. <laughs> how did you spend so much money on movies that look bad? Like, surely at some point in the millions of dollars worth of salaries you're paying, someone turned around and said, Hey, this is terrible. (laughs) Should we fix that? No, the answer is no, they shouldn't. I guess so. When they're spending 180 million or whatever on the newest Jurassic World sequel, and it's just the most nothing happening movie you will ever watch in your life. No one's like, uh, what if this movie was good? They're just like... It'll make money, who cares? But it's like, you can... You're spending the money anyway. You might as well make it good. 
you can do both. You're allowed to do both. You're allowed to make money anyway and also allowed to make a good movie. But mm. alas, film executives, they're not to think about quality. They just want money. They want to swim in their money pools and they want the return on investment. You're going to make us, you're going to make more money if it's good. <laughs> well, sometimes you might make less money if it's good. That makes no sense. Because people are like, it's confusing, or I don't like it. Because in order to be good, you usually need some kind of creative vision instead of making soulless, empty slop that won't make people feel anything, but it also won't make them angry. Or just be a TikTok meme. That's all you need, yes, with your weird white supremacist vibes. <laughs> yeah, that is the biggest, like... I would like to be involved in something like that, but it just feels like you you walk into an alt-right meeting. It does. It's like, oh, we're Proud Boys. We're going to the Minions on the way to our Proud Boy meeting. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go to the Minions, and then afterwards we're going to talk about how much we hate minorities and women. The way they're freaking on the escalators with their hand poses. It's like, no. Yeah, the hand no. pose, man. There should never be a pose. A bunch of, like, mid-twenties white men should never do a pose together. Nope. Never, never, just never. Just inherently puts off bad vibes. <laughs> yeah, especially while wearing suits. It's just something about the whole ensemble they're going Well, they all look there. like Tories. That's true. That doesn't help. Like, that's the thing. And the Tories are exploding this week, so that's nice. Ah, yeah, what's happening in the old Britain? Well, Boris has finally reached a scandal he can't, cannot overcome. <laughs> and what he is. Uh, he tried to appoint a sex pest to a world that he knew was a sex pest and denied he knew it was a sex pest, but then turns out he knew it was a sex pest, then said he just forgot he was a sex pest. Aren't they all sex pests? Well, yes, there is apparently a line that he says, it's like, all the sex pests are supporting me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that reminds me of, like, a bunch of stuff came out about the Australian Parliament, where it was like, they kept using the the confessional, like, church in the White House equivalent, uh, which is Parliament House, um, no, not South Parliament House, I forget what they actually know, but maybe Parliament House, I don't know. It's been a while since I went to Canberra. But they kept using the church area for all their hookers and <laughs> sex parties. Of course. <laughs> they couldn't use anything else in the building. Well, that was the room that no one was going in. <laughs> it's like it's empty, it's fine. To go commit their heinous sex crimes. Oh, god damn it. Their alleged hein heinous sex crimes. Mm. So Boris has finally resigned today. Yeah, I actually did it. Yeah, even if the timeline of when he will step down is still a little unclear. But who's going to be the King of England now? Uh, you. Oh, that'd be sick. I'd turn the franchise around. It's actually the Dave Taylor redemption story after he failed in the World X Cup. They're like, no, we're going to put him in charge of England. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you can't manage an X Division team, but... You can manage a country. <laughs> you can manage a world superpower. Because like, the X-Men is about no limits. It's very hard to comprehend where there are plenty of limits on power. Well, based on Boris Johnson, there might be that not much, might not be that many limits on power, but still. <laughs> That's our political corner here on You've Got to Be Kidding Me. That's what people come for. Our political takes. Yeah. Which started with, like, movie discussion. Which I guess is how it always develops. Mm. Our political takes that hopefully are underscored by our close personal friend and ally, Buff Bagwell. <laughs> it's very funny seeing people lap that up. You know what? <laughs> the Venn diagram, right? Uh huh. Of people who like bought that. Mm hmm. And GCW fans. Right. <laughs> are a circle. <laughs> the worst part is you couldn't say, guys, he's clearly working you because they'd get like, no, he's being wholesome and good. And they'd jump on Trevor you. Trevor Dame like took it from like every angle. <laughs> Just back away, just slowly back away, and let people have their fun with their clearly fake account. Well, have not we fake, not, not learnt not to trust anyone? <laughs> no one can be redeemed, everyone's a piece of shit. But especially, if someone is trying to sell your own political and social opinions back to you, do not believe them, especially, as we've learned, in the space of professional wrestling. Yeah. And with all that in uh, mind, we want to shout out to all of our best friends for subscribing to the Patreon, <laughs> tnhad.com. It's been a wonderful month. A lot of stuff going up there. We have the first episode of our Global Force series up there now. We'll have a Rain Takers coming up. We'll have some other bullshit. Who knows what's happening over there? 
Yeah, so you can head to teenagead.com. You can get our show notes, which are basically like a, a, a book chapter on the month of May that is TNA. It's 11 pages worth of notes on the month of TNA. You can get our watch along of NWA TNA pay review number 95, which is the show we did the watch along for this month. You can also get our full series on the 2010 Monday Night Wars, where we watched every episode of Raw and Impact that went head to head. You can get our full series of Ring Cat King, where, you can, where we reviewed every single episode of Ring Cat King. As you said, we were on to GFW now now uh, you can also get our drafts you can get our, our end of year awards you can get our watch along of one of those wrestlemanias we did remember that oh yeah all that and more waiting for you at tnachat.com or patreon.com slash kidding me so before we get into the show liam what did you want to talk about i wanted to also give a shout out to me being on the emerald flow show for the half year puro awards if you want to hear a 6 a.m liam who's very tired go listen whose microphone exploded right before recording. <laughs> which is why I have a new one. Liam has bought himself a new microphone, which is the reason we are slightly late on this episode. It's lightly being yeah. a week, but still. Yeah, blame the Emerald Flow Show. <laughs> it's all Paul and Gerard's fault. <laughs> so before we go in there, obviously, I think um, you should also give your uh, Puro Company of the Year. Uh, Gleet. Ah, there we go. Duh. Tell you what, I wasn't the only Gleet voter. Who else voted for Gleet? Oh, you have to listen and find out. Ooh. As we were mentioned, Patreon, we will be covering Wrestle 1 and Gleet. Mm. Liam has been assigned the task of working out how we actually cover that. But people ask yeah. for it, and we will do it. By people who we mean literally one person asks for each, but that's all we set the bar at, and we will do it. Yeah, um, someone on the VOW Discord says they have a bunch of the early shows, and so I'm trying to get them to send them to me. So Nice. Um, and I said that we'll start covering Glee once hooting and hollering. Which might be soon, who knows. <laughs> well, the first hooting and hollering show happened just 30 minutes ago, Garrett, so... Oh, that was the DDT show, was it? Yes. I gotta watch that show just to, for the noise. Just for the noise! Yeah. And, um, well, there was also the, um, Nomads. The Nomads Joshi show also had hooting and hollering. Good for them. Both in Shinjuku Face, so I guess all Shinjuku Face shows moving forward are probably going to have hooting and hollering. All shows should now be held from Shinjuku Face, just to allow the hoots. <laughs> With a 50% uh, capacity. <laughs> yeah, so there's like 350 people there. And then after September, everyone can run Korokan Hall as well. And that's it. Oh, and Oda Ward Gymnasium. They're the, the three good venues now. Hmm. And one last note on Patreon before we get started. When we hit 100 patrons, we will be reviewing All Wheels Wrestling. We set that as a goal. <laughs> Great. The Vroom Vroom Race Cars Wrestling, the best wrestling show ever put together. We will review it. I have no clue about this at all. <laughs> I want to give a one more thanks to everybody who both listened to and obviously participated in the 20th anniversary episode, which is our last episode. All those people, I think, were very smart and very funny and very good. And if you haven't listened to that episode, if you saw it's like a, it's not a timeline episode in your timeline, it's not like a month of TNA. If you're like, oh, I don't want to listen to people talking about 20 years of TNA, I would recommend you go back and listen to it. I think it was a very good episode and a very good encapsulation of 20 years of TNA. And also we got a bunch of new listeners from it. So if you're a new listener now listening, also hello, welcome to our madness. Oh god, I gotta step out game. Oh, good way good way to bring people in when they they first come back is um talking about the gentle minions. Oh god, the gentle minions is a horrible word. <laughs> Alright, that brings us to May 2004 TNA, and the first major news story of the month is a pretty darn big one. TNA officially announced the debut of their first television show, which will debut on Fox Sports Net on Friday, June 4th at 3 p.m. It is the debut of TNA Impact. Wow, future five-time winner of worst television show. <laughs> you know what? Five is actually pretty low. It's fine. <laughs> uh, it is like funny to see because Mike Tanay introduced the second show of the month with their groundbreaking, earth-shattering announcement, which was the FSN deal that they will be debuting on, on FSN in June. And it, it is interesting. Like that show is still on the air today after 18 years and 900 episodes. So it's like you know what? It is a groundbreaking, earth-shattering announcement. Well done, TNA. Yeah, with, um, I'm sure at the time people were like, ha 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 ha, because everything TNA does gets a ha 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 ha. Mm. But knowing where we are now, one of the longest running wrestling television shows ever, so. It has worked out in at least some way. Mm. And look, realistically, like, this is a time buy. 
the, with an estimated cost of about 15 grand per episode. And it's a 52 episode deal. Oh, if it was a fucking movie, they could run this for years. <laughs> and an out on both sides uh, after 26, halfway through. And like the whole idea here is that it's to get on TV, build an audience, get decent ratings, and try and get something better than buying time on FSN. Whether that's FSN paying them to do the show, or whether that's finding something on another television network. And we know, like, that gamble paid off. It ultimately resulted in a Spike TV deal. So, all the losers and haters, when this deal was announced, and they were like, this company is still kind of doomed, like, this is the last gas play that probably won't work, you were wrong! It did work! I mean, like, it's not a bad idea. Mm. I don't know. I mean, listen, do, would we pre- all prefer that our, our wrestling television show gets picked up from Warner for millions of dollars and then immediately gets a bump in it like six months in? Yes, that's the ideal scenario. But when you have nothing else, you might as well go for this play. You're already going to lose the money. It's fine. You like bankruptcy and then get out of paying it. You're fine. Yeah. And it's also it's Panda's money. Who cares? <laughs> so Yeah. Like there's re- like this is a this is a great idea. It's a great gamble. And like I get it. And when you look at where the company is now, where the company is in May 2004, what else can they do? Like the the weekly pay-per-views aren't cutting it. Everybody knows that. They have to continue producing them or else the company goes under. It doesn't exist. But it's not like there's suddenly going to be an audience of millions of people who are going to start buying these pay-per-views. That's not the path forward for this company. So they have to start looking about like well what can be Obviously, television, paid television ideally, but they can't get paid television. They couldn't get it in 2002. They still can't get it now. How how can they increase their chances of getting paid television? By having a proven television product. So that's their gamble. That's their step. That's their pay at an estimated 15 grand per episode to get on TV. They gotta build their reel. And it's a similar, like, case to... Well, the only real option they had at the start was weekly pay-per-views when you really, like, drill down into it. It's a similar case here. It's like their only reasonable step forward is this paid TV deal. Whether it was with WGN or FSN or whoever to find somebody to, to put you on the air for a year so you could basically have a proof of concept. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm, I mean, I'm into it. I'm into this idea. I'm looking forward to TV. I'm looking forward to the pay-per-view stopping. <laughs> That's not for another few months, but sure. We'll get there. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. The time slot isn't TNA's first choice, but the prestige of being affiliated with FSN can open doors in the future. If ratings are strong enough and the product is considered up to standards, TNA could shift into a better time slot. Jarrett was scheduled to appear on FSN's Best Damn Sports Show, period. Their marquee show, basically. That's not just sports. This show keeps getting brought up in the TNA ethos. Mm Mm-hmm. I, like... I feel like, you know, in the the two and a bit years now that we've covered, the best damn sports show period keeps getting mentioned. Well, you will eventually have a full crossover with the best damn sports show period. Oh, the best damn wrestling show period. That's the name of the crossover. (laughs) Holy shit. So Jarrett was on it He uh, to promote TNA. They showed footage of Johnny Fairplay. They showed footage of Brian Urlacher, footage of the Tennessee Titans beating up Jeff Jarrett. Uh, host Tom Arnold said that's the best thing I've ever seen so you know it's it's some exposure yeah it's not a bad idea again heading into this TV stuff so Dixie Carter's quote from the press release the national telecast of impact on Fox Sports Net marks a milestone for TNA entertainment and the wrestling industry oh sorry uh, I'm stepping on your toes here would you like to take that Liam <laughs> <sighs> the national telecast of <laughs> Dixie is deranged. entertainment in the wrestling industry. She's become a full mad gold prospector. Yeehaw. Dixie Carter, president of TN Entertainment LLC, said Total non-stop action. Wrestling has continued to grow and exceed expectations over our history. As we celebrate our second anniversary in June, we are excited this opportunity with Fox Sports Net and Universal Studios Orlando will expose a wider range of viewers to our distinctive brand of professional wrestling. Follow me on Twitter. A TNA press release explained how TNA is different from the competition. I'm always interested in this. Is this me? <laughs> no, this is a, a George Greenberg of FSN quote. You're fine. 
Can you do it in the style of the TNA pay-per-view video packages? Oh, sorry. TNA Wrestling separates itself from the competitors by delivering quality family programming <laughs> that focuses on athletic in-ring competition instead of over-the-top shocking antics that have become all too common in Rainstream. <laughs> He's not, like, that's all lies. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, TNA of the last, like, three months is that. Oh, sorry, not the three months. <laughs> the TNA of we're trying to get on television, let's clean up our act, is a clean for a normal wrestling product. The TNA before that, maybe not so much. I am pleased about the entertainment value wrestling can bring to FSN. I believe Impact will bolster our Friday afternoon schedule and provide another FSN destination for young viewers. FSN reaches more than 80 million homes through its 20 regional sports networks. And Jared told Between the Ropes Radio that Impact will be innovative and have no limits. Just like the X Division. Yeah, it's not about television limits, it's about no limits, even though the show literally has time limits, so it is about limits. But outside of such ambiguous cliches, didn't specify the format of the show. I mean, I'm sh I think it'll be a wrestling show. To be fair, they do start making some changes. As we mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about it more in the June episode, but they introduced all, like, the, the Fox box up the time limit stuff, we'll talk about that next month. But they are also introducing a six-sided ring. I am unfamiliar with a six-sided ring, Garrett. Could you tell me about it? So you take a ring and you add two mm -hmm. more sides. Well, that's fucking nuts. And then you have more angles to do springboards off of. And the rope tension is tighter, Mike Denae would always tell us. Oh. What if um, you made it a triangle or a star? Oh, well, a star ring would be mm. interesting. Well, if Kota Ibushi gets his way. I'm not sure how well a triangle ring would work. You'd have to make it quite big. Yeah, that, that one seems less plausible. I think a star ring could be done. Mm. I just hope you never want to run the ropes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to run the ropes. Maybe that's something Ibushi wants to cut out of professional wrestling. TNA wrestlers who are scheduled to work the June 3 Orlando taping are concerned that they won't have enough time to work out in the six-sided ring before they work their matches. In most cases, the wrestlers have not worked in that type of ring before. They say that while it may not seem that much different to the untrained eye, it is going to be a bigger adjustment than people seem to realize. It's also worth noting that similar six-sided rings have also been blamed for injuries suffered by AAA and Japanese wrestlers, so the TNA guys have more to be concerned about whether they can have good matches in the new ring. They probably should, um... Fly him out like a day early or something to see guys work out in the ring. <laughs> or just like bring the ring to Nashville. Oh, yeah. Why don't. Oh, wait. Do they have a time period where they have a six sided ring in Orlando and a four sided ring in Nashville? No. They. I, th it seems like at one stage the idea was just to do the six sided ring for TV, at least early. Uh, but from here, like they introduced the six sided ring in Nashville immediately after they do it in Orlando. So is this the last month we have of the four-sided ring? No, the last four-sided ring show will be the June 2nd show. So the debut of the six-sided ring is the June 4th Impact debut, and then the first weekly pay-per-view of June will still have the four-sided ring. Garrett, I, I, would you care to have a brief production meeting on air? Sure, go. Should we do a watch-along for the first Impact? Well, I was thinking, because we uh, the, the other show I, we should do a watch-along for in June is probably the debut of King of the Mountain, which is the first yeah, show Yeah, that was the first one I had in mind. So we could basically just sit down and do them back-to-back. -back. We, could, we could watch the June 2nd show and then watch the Impact debut, so it would be quite easy because they're sequential. Sweet. On-air production. So you'll get two watch-alongs coming up for the J June episode. Two whole watch-alongs of the first episode of Impact and the June 2nd weekly pay-per-view. Yeah, I think um, the Impact one's fun. I think mm. that's... Uh... An important one too, and a show that I don't think I've ever seen. The debut of Impact. It's a good episode. You'd hope so. TNA Wrestling will tape its weekly Impact program every Thursday at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, at the twenty-two thousand square foot Soundstage Twenty One. I thought I was going to say twenty-two thousand feet. <laughs> See, <laughs> gigantic. It's a, it can hold about twelve hundred at full capacity. The way TNA set it up, hold about nine hundred. America's Coda can hold. <laughs> in many ways, it is. In that it is a small, loud venue. <laughs> that many companies have worked. Yeah, well, I, as I like to call it, the elite zone. <laughs> I will strangle you. It's not even the same one, is it? It's a different soundstage. Yeah, I think they do 19. Yeah. Which is one TNA would eventually run, because it's smaller. Hmm. It will draw from theme park attendees. They will set up entrances both so that you can get in if you're a ticket holder, but also you can get in from the outside. 
A quote from Paul Mina from Universal Studios. We are thrilled to have total non-stop actions impact here at Universal. It affords our theme park guests the opportunity to be part of the production audience and cheer for their favorite wrestling icons from a front row seat quote. TNA will be keeping costs down by flying and paying only 10 TNA wrestlers each taping each week. I don't think that holds. I think they're actually pretty generous in the end. So yeah, two tapings a week now that they will do the live paper on Wednesday and then fly straight to Orlando to do TV on a Thursday. I'm interested in seeing how the restrictions of only having 10 people would have worked out. Because, like, the main event of the first episode is a six-man match. <laughs> so it's not a thing that you even wow. remotely try and stick to. <laughs> that's that's 60% right there. <laughs> and the opener is a six-man tag. So they're, they're already at the 12. And there's also another tag match. So it's up to 16. So the, that whole idea... How many of them are locals? <laughs> I have no idea where, where they got that, that 10 people idea from PW Torch, but they, if it was an idea pit, pit bandied around at any stage, it will not be stuck to. So they are buying time with the unconfirmed figure being the price of 15 grand a week from the Wrestling Observer. They have control of most of, but not all of the ad time, so they can make some of that money back selling ads. Uh, yeah, I, I've thought of a, a, a fun uh, thing. Go on. Isn't it funny... That the first I episode of Impact was main evented with a six-man tag. It was a six-man match, but go on. Fuck. Well, you've ruined everything for me. <laughs> by it, your non-specificity. It opened with a six-man tag. Does that work? Does that still work? No, I was going to say that the first episode of Global Force was <laughs> main evented by a six-man tag. To be fair, you could actually tie it to the... Because the, the opening match is kind of an international X-Division match, so it is kind of the same thing as what main evented no, the first episode count. of Global Force. It doesn't, but... doesn't count. <laughs> Speaking of Global Force leader Jeff Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett held a locker room meeting prior to the May 12th pay-per-view to announce the Fox Sports Net deal. Jarrett opened the meeting by thanking the wrestlers for their patience and hard work. He said he had not anticipated what a black guy professional wrestling had in the television industry, adding that he and other office workers had to battle long and hard to get the show on the air. I'm... <laughs> Be like, oh, what a black guy wrestling has. Don't watch our old tapes. Don't watch them. Don't watch them. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, let's be real, like, wrestling isn't exactly the most lucrative TV thing. But it's their own fault, because they have, like, the lowest common denominator bullshit television that they constantly stoop to. It was also an industry that, at its hottest, was based around the lowest common de denominator, like, uh, at, like, pitch and uh, presentation, so. Mm. Like, uh, they always talk about how, like, wrestling has some of the lowest ad rates of any television product. But, like, they perpetuate the stereotype and then give out about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying he's right, but I, I'm just saying it is a a fact that this is an, an element of the professional wrestling and broadcasting industry. Yeah, I'm not saying he's wrong either. I'm saying it's his own fault. Yeah, well, what are you expecting to go up there and be like, hey, guys, really sorry we fucked around for the first two years, but we're here now. Yes. Well, he's not going to do that. Uh, because of concerns from FSN executives because they want a very clean, normal wrestling show, Jarrett reminded the wrestlers to refrain from swearing and making any lewd gestures during their matches. Even Storm, during well, he delivers one of the sorry about your damn lucks, he's like, you know what I say about luck. Sorry about your luck. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Sorry about your darn luck. Dude can't say his catchphrase. Really is damn too much? I, I think he ultimately, ultimately it's not because he ends up saying his catchphrase, but yeah, it's weird. He also told the crew that the company had hired a new seamstress to help them improve their looks for television. Jarrett added that the company is still in the process of making travel arrangements to get the talent from Nashville to Orlando for the Thursday tapings. There's some concern that they, they might not be able to make their flights because of their hard night of partying in Nashville. Maybe they shouldn't party. They should go do their jobs. They can party on Thursdays after Impact now instead of on Wednesdays after after the pay wrestling is the only industry man where you go to your boss and go hey we oh, it's gonna be a problem like getting to work the next day because we're gonna party too hard mm -hmm. and then like that'd be an actual consideration of the the employment being like yeah you're, you're right guys we'll, we'll try and think of something we don't want to ruin your vibes in good time it's like, just wait till the tapings are done and then go party in fucking Orlando. <laughs> Which is probably a better party scene. No, Nashville's a pretty yeah, good Yeah, I was going to say, I'm city, sure the Orlando still. scene kicks the Nashville scene's ass. Some Nashville people are going to come for you for that. Ah, uh, whatever. Don't you talk nothing bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she seems more uh, cogent than she did earlier. Don't you do... 
<laughs> so there's some talk about how they're going to get wrestlers down. There's talk that they might bust them, which wrestlers are very much against, I think, for good reason. There's talk that they might also charter flights to fly them down to make sure they can get down on Wednesday night instead of Thursday morning. This is cool. This feels, I don't know, something about it makes it feel very, like, Major League presentation, you know what I mean? Just the whole background stuff. Just that they're on TV. It's like, oh, we have to talk about logistics about going from one taping to the other. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it feels like anything that's sort of like, uh, you know, some show on the road where it's like, oh, we have to get the the, the group of people to the next thing. and blah, blah, blah. It adds a certain, um, it doesn't feel like you're Nashville indie, you know what I mean? Mm. I, it, it's basically like the start of chapter two of the company. It's like you had the first chapter, which is the weekly pay-per-views. Now you have the TV era, which I, I think this like chapter two probably basically runs up to Kurt's debut. Mm. And then you have uh, a bunch of other chapters from there. But it does feel like, you know, we're turning a page. It's a new TNA in a, in a new television era. It's the new face of professional wrestling. The new Fox Sports net deal has changed the mood in the locker room. While everyone seems happy, the company is taking the step. Some of the younger wrestlers are said to be nervous about working in front of a national audience. Although the pay-per-views are technically national, the wrestlers know they will be seen by some more viewers on Fox Sports Net. Some of these wrestlers are said to be concerned that their popularity in Nashville may not carry over to Orlando or the rest of the country. To which I would say, that Nashville crowd is dead silent half the time, so I think you'll be fine. Yeah. But, um, then they, you got over there too, so it's fine. Yeah, if you're good, you'll get over. The age-old adage. Hmm. Meanwhile, some of the veterans who have worked WWE, WCW, or ECW in the past are excited to be getting back in the mix. There are also some wrestlers who are concerned that they would be lost in the shuffle, especially if TNA brings in some bigger names that have been rumored, such as Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Scott Hall, DDP, Kevin Nash, and The Ultimate Warrior. Cool. Which does kind of end up happening. <laughs> so... I don't want any of those people brought in, except Kevin Nash. Um, I'd take Hall too, but if he wasn't, like, a mess. Ugh... <sighs> Also, I like DDP. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I like DDP, but I just, focus on your own guys. <laughs> come on. All of those people will come in other than Warrior at some stage or another. Yeah, you know, we were so uh, universally positive about the Hulk Hogan run. Mm. The word backstage is that TNA plans to hit the reset button when they launch the FSN show on June 4th. Meanwhile, other insiders say that the while the company will certainly attempt to spice things up, they will not completely abandon past storylines okay so a little category a little category b a soft reset as we say in the biz their third or fourth in the company history already <laughs> before they haven't done any hard resets yet uh but they will mm -hmm. oh and a fun note on the may 19th show there was never a mention of the fox sports net deal for the most hilarious of reasons they mentioned the new tv show and just said coming to a regional sports network in your area on june 4th and to check your local listings for the time because in demand and direct tv consider each other competition in demand which is the prime force behind tna being on asked them not to mention fox sports net because of the feeling fox will buy direct tv <laughs> So there's some fun <laughs> politics that can uh, that uh, that is stopping them from plugging their wrestling show. The old uh, Fox USA <laughs> thing that we're seeing now. Oh yeah, when WWE was moving from Spike to USA. Oh, we're seeing it now with with current day Fox and and USA Network, where they get pissy at each other for trying for hyping up Raw or SmackDown on the other show, mm. and wanting stars on one and the other. Yeah, there's this fun story when WWE was moving from what was Spike at the time to USA in the mid 2000s. They they desperately tried to sneak in mentions that they were leaving Spike. Yeah, didn't they do the same thing when like Spike was like they would mention Impact or run Impact ads or something like that at the same time? Uh, no, because Impact wouldn't have been launched until October. I thought there was like some sort of subtle thing about that, or maybe that was just like the idea was to get that as the cheaper replacement. Mm. Something along those lines. Because Impact ended up filling the velocity slot on Spike. Ooh. in the end before moving into better time slots that's our next um versus show <laughs> impact versus velocity yeah uh so yeah impact debuting june 4th uh, i will say as uh, we're already late in this episode but I, I will ask for patience for our, our upcoming couple of months because it's gonna be a pretty rough time where we have uh, June is a five pay-per-view month as well, by the way. So June will be five pay-per-views and five episodes of Impact, maybe four. I haven't checked that. So uh, the, the next few months, the June, July, August, and September episodes of the podcast 
We'll try to get them out every two weeks, but it's a lot of stuff to watch. So we'll, we'll do our best, and I will try to wrangle Liam, but it's a lot of stuff to watch. Garrett, this is Garrett's polite way of saying there will be times where I adamantly refuse to watch the things that I'm being told to watch. <laughs> also, just great timing here. I love to be going back to university in next week. <laughs> it's only for four months, and September is only half a month. Uh, listen, I'm just, I'm just going to have to... I don't know. Uh, find a way to implant them into my brain while I'm sleeping. You should get those uh, Facebook glasses and then just stream them to your eyes while you're walking or driving places. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll start watching them in class. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should put them on like the projector. Everyone can sit down and watch some episodes of Impact. I have a three hour like film study glass. <laughs> I'll just bring in episodes of Impact. Study the NWA TNA. So yeah, um, it's a lot. But once we're out, we're in we're in the, the green from now on, you know what I mean? Yeah, we should have no excuse for being late once we get out of the weekly pay-per-view era because it's one hour episodes of Impact and then a pay-per-view. That's, that's, that's what we've been fighting for this whole time. That's what you've been listening for this whole time. This has all been the preamble to the actual thing we want to cover. Yeah, this is the chapter one of our podcast. We're also moving into chapter two. Well, um... We'll change it. We'll, get, we'll call it something else. Wait. Oh, my God. When TNA does the name changes, can we change the name of the podcast? <laughs> to, to what? I don't know. We'll find something. We'll add NWA to our name as TNA take NWA off of theirs. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Uh, Johnny Fairplay was voted Survivor's best villain this week on a special edition of CBS's Survivor. When interviewed by Jeff Probst, Fairplay said he is now involved in pro wrestling, TNA wrestling, every Wednesday night on pay-per-view and starting June 4th, every Friday on Fox Sports Net. Fairplay has not been used by TNA in months after an initial flurry of angles on the weekly programs after he signed a one-year contract. With 26 dates guaranteed, TNA may not have soured on Fairplay as much as they had wanted to save their guaranteed dates with him until they secured national TV clearance. Now that they have it, Fairplay is expected to become a major weekly presence on the show in a main event storyline. Rumours of him reading an NWO-like invasion with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall are apparently not true, though. His role starting in June is to not being revealed by TNA. So that's definitely like someone's forum post. It's like, oh, uh, he should come in and he should be, the, we're the bad guys. It's like the worm Johnny Fairplay is here with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. He's like, hey, yo, and they're taking over Impact. And then they're going to head to head with Raw. Uh, I like that everything is the NWO. Listen, we are going to get a fake NWO by the end of the year, so look forward to it. Is that the Kings of Wrestling or the band or... <laughs> Multiple dip Even Immortal was just a fake NWO. Main Event Mafia was just suited <laughs> NWO. It's all just the same story. Biker NWO, suited NWO. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay someone because I won't be able to make this. But like some sort of fan cam of the Main Event Mafia to the Gentle Minions song. <laughs> 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 See if we can get a, a, a shot of them sometime in TNA history walking in a line, going to their minions. <laughs> <screen>. <laughs> All right, Garrett, you find that and I'll put it together because you're probably the one who actually will know a sh random show where they all walked down a hallway together. Oh, there probably is one. <laughs> I got money. <laughs> God damn it. <sighs> A real hard pivot here. Jerry Jarrett, who co-founded DNA in 2002, underwent triple bypass heart surgery in Nashville, Tennessee last week. He experienced chest pains and dizziness before the TNA baby and was hospitalized that night. Jarrett is 61 years old and has been involved in the professional wrestling industry for over 40 years. So it's finally caught up with him. Yeah, dealing with Vince Russo's bullshit. <laughs> finally, everything else he could deal with. He Like 40 years of professional wrestling he could get through, but two years of Russo and his heart just couldn't cut it. Yeah, he had Russo being like, Dixie, I should be in charge. This is why I should lead us heading into the TV era. And he was just like, his heart was like, I'm out of this, man. I'm done. I need to save you from yourself by <laughs> freaking nearly having a heart attack. Ugh. Jared, who had joked in an interview just a few weeks ago about his lifestyle not being the healthiest for a man his age, came out of surgery well, but was told he was going to have to take it easy for a few months. And he's still alive today, so it clearly went well. Jared noted at the time that he wakes up running and doesn't stop and has often eaten one meal per day and not until 6pm. So he gets up like crack of dawn, works all day and doesn't eat. And then he had a heart attack. What are you doing for TNA? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, he does also run a construction company. It's not just, not just TNA. That makes a lot of sense. I was like, I, I don't know where, like, uh, 18-hour days for TNA is going. 
Yeah, you're just you're talking to talent and you're trying to just keep Vince Russo in a box, basically, constantly. That's 16 hours of the 18 hour day. Mm. TNA is shifting away from the NWA initials since they don't own the rights to the name. When dealing with growth in general and a national network in particular, they need to assure partners in marketing the product that they have full rights to the name and uh, all associated revenues. TNA has been preparing for this transition for many months as the website URL TNAWrestling.com has linked to the same website as NWATNA.com. Since the last year, all references to NWA have been dropped other than a small logo on the website and the names of the titles, which gives the titles, in theory, a sense of history and prestige. The new Fox Sports program is called TNA Impact. It's not clear yet whether the NWA initials will be completely eliminated, but without question, TNA Wrestling is the main name of the promotion now. So yeah, they're they're phasing out the NWA. They will still have the NWA titles, but it will no longer be NWA TNA. It will no longer be like the NWA freaking uh, board of directors appointing an NWA director of authority. None of that stuff. It's just TNA. I'm surprised they didn't go straight for their own titles. I kind of get like the the history and prestige of the the NWA title. It does add a little more oomph when your title is just like held by Killing Styles, Jarrett, and Shamrock, which is the only people it's been held for by, by for two years. I just meant like with TV. I'm surprised they didn't like do a complete switch. Yeah, I guess if they're ever gonna do it, this is probably the time to do it, right? Yeah, like you could have just made it the King of the Mountain match for the TNA title. Which would have been so appropriate if the first TNA Championship match was a King of the Mountain match. Won by Jeff Jarrett. Oh, perfect. Yeah, they wait another uh, three years to to, uh, get rid of the titles. Silly. Vince Russo issued a statement on the internet to announce that he is going to ministry school in Colorado. He was telling friends backstage that he plans to continue working for TNA, although no one seems sure whether his school schedule will force him to give up his current on-air role. Me about this show. You're going to ministry school? <laughs> no, my school schedule will force him to give up his current <laughs> on-air role. I'll still be behind the scenes. Just be me monologuing? I'll, I'll, I'll find someone that you, that you can replace me with. It'll have to be just a, a charming, witty Australian person. God damn, I'm the only one. There's never been another. I'll get Hugh Jackman on the on the pod. In that letter he wrote on the website, he expressed his frustration with wrestling, saying he was in deep depression from WCW, and until six months ago, TNA was no different, saying it's every man for himself, dog eat dog, and total <laughs> paranoia and politics. To which I say, Vince... I wonder who made that environment! <laughs> to the exact same thing I said about Jeff earlier, that that's your own fault. Vince, fuck you, that's your own fault! <sighs> uh, whatever, man. Hmm... <laughs> <laughs> This man cannot be helped. Oh, Vinny Roo. He's the worst as well. I hate him. I hate him. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we get to the shows, but I'm fucking sick of this Vince Russo character. He's too skinny, too. I don't like skinny Vince Russo. It's like skinny Walter. Yeah, well, skinny Walter's cursed. Skinny Vince Russo is just... I think it's, um... It emphasizes the terrible character somehow. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll save my rant about the character until we talk about the shows. <laughs> It looks as if the TNA ROH feud is firing back up as TNA officials are trying to recruit CM Punk and Samoa Joe. Those two are good people that you should bring in if you're starting a television show. Mm, technically, Punk is under contract to TNA, although he has not signed the new amendment that allows the company to collect a 15% booking fee, which is a big point of contention this month. That the people are going back and forth about whether or not they like or dislike. Because there's a lot of wrestlers who actually don't get other bookings other than TNA who are like, we don't care. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not. I'm sure there's not a single person in the locker room who's like, "Yeah, man, I love that idea." Yeah, it means I have to charge fifteen percent more and probably get less bookings. So there's fear that ROH is basically like literally coming for Ring of Honor, going for the throat. Just like let's take Punk, let's take Joe, and let ROH die. Yeah. Well, they're both still here. <laughs> Punk moved to Philadelphia last year to become the instructor at the ROH school, so he's a lot riding on his relationship with the company, and also, you know, he had that Teddy Hart stuff, and I don't think he ever particularly enjoyed working DNA. <laughs> Didn't seem like it. Uh, at this point, ROH officials have yet to offer contracts to the wrestlers, so the members of the rosters are free agents with no legal ties that bind them to ROH. So they're, they're free to be poached from, which is a long-standing issue in Ring of Honor history for a very long time. Long-standing issue in every TW game I've ever done. It's very annoying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> They're talking with Samoa Joe about bringing him in with Johnny Fairplay. 
<laughs> the company is back talking with Fairplay, thinking his notoriety will help them when they start on TV. Fairplay suggested the idea of Joe and the office people, <laughs> who deep down hate ROH, and while it's never said publicly, several close to the situation say it's a common theme, love the idea of stripping ROH of its champion. There is no deal in place because Joe at this point has refused to bail on ROH without at least going out professionally, and as of the weekend, the negotiations had not reached the serious level. I'm so excited to see this Joe push for the first time. It is, like, basically the best thing they've ever done, the first, like, year of Joe. Like, I've only seen the payoff. Mm. So, I'm very excited to see the week-to-week. Because, like, when you think of, well, how should Samoa Joe translate to a weekly television product? They just nail it. It's perfect. Yeah. Which is, like, astounding with how little commitment they have to anything. Mm. To have, like... A year-long process. Where it's just like, we're going to push this guy as he should be pushed. And then he's going to get over and it's going to work. Like, no one's had a year-long push in this company. Uh, who's had the longest sustained push in this <laughs> company? That's not <laughs> Jeff know, Jarrett. Great. It's not the owner of the company. Mike Tanay, baby? <laughs> <laughs> like, even Vince Russo took an L. <laughs> yeah, AJ kinda. Oh, come on. <laughs> But, like, he was champion from June until October, and then champion from May He to had June. a push, it just was never good. <laughs> but he's been, like, a featured player. It's not like he's a background guy, you know? Yeah, like I said, it was a push, but not a good push. No. No one else? No, no one else. Like, to really emphasize this point, it's like, it feels like no one gets more than a three-week push in this company. So... To the idea of a full year being dedicated to a new guy is insane. I guess they kind of pushed Chris Saban. I don't know. Come on. Kind of. Come on, man. This AMW. They pushed AMW. And then they broke him up weirdly and now they're doing singles feuds. But they're not broken up. They're just doing other things. I know. And I was talking about the other time they broke them up. No, they just flirted with sex and then denied sex. <laughs> They flirted with sex. Oh, I'm going to miss the sex jokes. Yeah, and you just have the wholesome Vince Russo with his dopey, freaking conflicted face. All right, let's get to it. All right, let's go through. No, we'll start with the World X Cup. We'll start with something that's at least somewhat enjoyable to talk about. Sure. I just want to mention, like, for everyone listening right now, is normally when you, you know, you can see on our topic sheets, when you go to com that we uh, have, like, all these broad topics down the bottom, and normally there's a ton of them. Mm. This is so bad. <laughs> yeah, you see, there's a ton of, like, small programs. Like, in the best of the rest, there's, like, five different things, but they're all, like, oh, somebody had, like, a match or two with somebody. Yeah, because they're all, like, one-week things. <laughs> It's a, it's a weird month. And by weird, you mean dull and boring, but sure. Yeah, it's just, it's again, it, there's a world title change this month, but they're somehow still in a holding pattern. Don't know how that works. TNA operates within a, a level of just molasses mm. that somehow, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's like if the the ending output of sugar was there, while still in the molasses stage. Mm. It's truly a hybrid of chemistry. All right, so we'll start with the, the World X Cup. So the World X Cup debuts on May 26th, and they build to it through the month. We had one match building to it at the end of last month, if you remember, it was Team NWA versus Team AAA. It's been a while, you might not remember that, but Team uh, NWA beat Team AAA in an eight-man tag at the end of last month. They begin building to the World X Cup. The, the May 5th weekly pay-per-view, NWA TNA pay-per-view number 93, we have a, a Team Canada versus Team USA match, which I loved. I thought this match kicked ass. It did kick ass. It was just all of the good wrestlers having a good wrestling match, because it's the new Team Canada, the Team Canada that we know and love, the Team Canada that's on our poster this month, which is Petey Williams, Bobby Roode, Eric Young, and Johnny Devine, managed by Scott Demore. It is, the, like, as we said last month, the Team Canada, not a Team Canada. I mean, it's exactly what you know and love. Yeah. Still, it feels like this company just doesn't want to make P.D. Williams the focus point, but they keep having to go back to him, which is very funny. Because they said at the, the end of last month that he's the new captain, he's the leader of Team Canada, but now they've brought in Bobby Roode, and they're like, well, he's the big guy, and he's clearly, like, the star. Maybe we should make it Bobby Roode. But, like, they're always committed to P.D. We can't just, like, remove captainship from P.D. immediately. They did. Week one, they said that Bobby Roode was the captain of Team Canada. 
<laughs> no, I, I, and then I think they on commentary they they did talk about how uh, like JB just fucked up. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but it does feel like PD has always been the guy they had to go back to. Because Mike today says on commentary, it's like, did he just say Bobby Roode is team captain? And then uh, Don covers for him being like, no, I think he just said he's the new member. <laughs> Mm, well, that's not covering. You can't, just, you can't just pretend they said something else. He's doing his best. JB just misspoke. Is JB doing his best? He does tend to do things wrong a lot. A lot. I suppose he's up every night making a thousand graphics. So he's he's never slept in two years. And then like his days are this company. So he doesn't have time to read the format to see whether it should be raining and defending or just. Raining. Yeah, his eyes are too busy bleeding from staring at his monitor. So this match is Team Canada against the Team USA team of Jerry Lini, Skipper, Chris Saban, and Christopher Daniels. And they just have what I thought was the best match of this month by a landslide. It's like a real kick-ass eight-man tag. They do all the moves in the world. They do a ton of moves. Team Canada are one of the rare Nashville acts that are still kind of over. I think they get heat because people obviously hate Canadians. I guess. And here, I think part of that is I think Scott Demore is really, really good. He's got to more rules. Mm. And, like, not just as a character, every time he gets physical, he delivers as well. Yeah. Because he has a match this month, which we'll talk about in the next episode. Yeah, the match of the month. Giant Divine's Moonsault, by the way. Great. Danny Divine, man. I am blown away by this guy. He's a good wrestler. Does a sweet moonsault, busts out a shooting star. Mm. Guy's nuts. Chris Saban gets a hot tag in this match as well, where he just runs wild, and it's, like, the best Chris Saban has ever looked in TNA. I like the Chris Saban story of this tournament. Tournament? Series. Yeah, it's a tournament. We're just in the the preview stages of the tournament. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll talk about the actual World X Cup show. I like the like story of like Jerry Lynn's like leadership in that in that show, where it's like all his decisions kind of paid off, even though he couldn't deliver, but his team did, and that's how he's a good leader. Hmm. So yeah, Saban tags in. He hits a tornado DDT, which is oh, and EY sold it like a million bucks. And Saban, ah, oh, Saban, and like power bombs Divine out of the air and just running wild. I love Chris Saban. He's the best. This match really is all the names that we will come to know and love in this company. Yeah, it's it's a lot of people showing up now that will have strong legacies in the company. Obviously, you have Bobby Roode making his debut in this match. You have Eric Young, who has been around a little bit, but this is like his his start as a, a regular featured guy. And Divine and PD. And PD's, like, improving every week. Like, every single week PD's out here, he gets better. Yeah. It's getting smoother, too. Like, not just, like, fundamentally getting the structure. Mm. His, like, smoothness and everything he does is becoming more Major League. Because we talked about when he was in that debut match against Hoovy and Jerry Lynn. It's like, oh, he looked pretty rough there. He looked very nervous. And now we're, what, three months down the line from that? It's like, oh no, he looks great now. By the time we get to the last match of this month, it's like, oh yeah, Petey's doing real good for himself now. In that Battle Royal, he was great too. Mm. So Lynn has Rude for the Cradle Pile Driver, but Scott Amore breaks the hockey stick over his back, giving Rude the roll of win. Team Canada have momentum heading into the X Cup, and Jerry Lynn has problems with Scott Amore. I love that, um, how gleeful Scott Amore was about breaking it. Mm. He's always happy to smash a hockey stick over somebody's back. A true Canadian. It's the most Canadians of things you can do. So, the second show of the month, we had a tag team match. Petey Williams and Bobby Roode faced Abismo Negro, and I didn't take down who teamed with Abismo Negro, because the whole story was it was two people. Yeah, I probably took it in the... And Hector Garza, because yeah, the whole story here was that uh, Hector Garza and Abismo Negro were the two guys representing AAA, but they changed it multiple times that week to, like, throw Team Canada off. You know what my favorite thing about that was? What? Abysmo Negro was the guy they replaced. <laughs> Hector Garza was the consistent name and you didn't put him down. Yeah, they, they, they threw me off. Uh, I like that story, but I couldn't tell if it was like, that was the actual reason or not. <laughs> no, it was probably just like they accidentally booked the wrong person or somebody got injured or somebody couldn't do it. Because like a lot of these matches are taped at once. Like the, the, the War Less Cup is a taped show at the end of the month. Say, similar to the, the America's X Up shows where they tape the matches over a couple of weeks. So these guys are working like a lot of matches over a period of time. So it might just be, eh, this guy's hurt, this guy's banged up, this guy already wrestled. So it has to be someone else. Mm. I like the way Don, every time he says Team AAA Mexico. Just to clarify. Well, it's like saying Team NWA America. He should say that too. Yeah, just to be clear. Well, they do kind of. Like, they jump between it. I wish they were just Team America. I hate that it's Team NWA. And, well, yeah. And they're all American. Ugh. 
You could at least have the thing where Sanjay was like he's billed as from being from Bombay, so maybe that's why they thought they couldn't call it Team America. But it's so much better. Well, then is Team America the movie out? <laughs> Can they just not do it because of that? <laughs> They're scared of being sued. Yeah, call it Team USA. But yes, they are Team NWA. They even like when they win, spoilers. They have a big American flag. <laughs> They are not representing the National Wrestling Alliance. That always bothered me, even when I was a kid and I had the DVD. <laughs> like, they're they're even freaking getting rid of the NWA initials all over the place, but they're still Team NWA. Yeah, that's silly. I don't like it. So, the ref was distracted as Demore hit Abismo Negro with a hockey stick. <laughs> a reoccurring theme here, allowing Rude to roll him up and win. Uh, Canada attacks after the match, but then Lynn makes the save. Lynn faces off with Demore, Demore escapes, and then Lynn challenges Demore to a match. He wants, he's like, give me five minutes in the ring with you. Then Demore is like, I will give you five minutes. I will give you as long as you want, if you can beat Bobby Rude. But if you lose to Bobby Rude, you must step down as captain of Team TNA. Yeah, you know, Bobby Rude, who has gotten... Two roll-ups. He's undefeated, Liam. He has never lost. Okay. A man who is a pro wrestling savant. Yeah. So an opener of the next show, May 19th, Jerry Lynn defeats Bobby Roode. Nice little match. Was a nice little match. Roode's a nice little wrestler. Well, it's, we're talking about how, like, there's no one that fills that Roode void anymore. Mm. Just a, a fundamentally sound... Wrestle guy. Yeah, a good, credible, like, technically proficient wrestler, but who also looks the part. Yeah. You don't really get a lot of that. Although I hate his gear. But he just has, like, plain red trunks. Why do you hate them so much? They look like shit, <laughs> would be my main reason. Normal red trunks. Yeah, they look like shit. <laughs> so Lynn won with a cradle pile driver, giving him five minutes in the ring with Scott Demore. And it was the best match of the month. <laughs> So yeah, Demore dominated. He jumped Lynn after Lynn had just wrestled. Lynn made his big comeback. But like, Demore was really good here. Like, just literally playing for every ounce he could get. And also, he beat the fuck out of him. <laughs> like, he just dominated the first eighty percent of this match. Mm. I did at least appreciate how Mike Tanay and Don West on commentary mentioned how like Scott Demore. We may know him as a manager, but he is in fact a wrestler and he runs a training school. So it's not like he's a complete nobody nerd. They also said he was, like, 700 times the size of Jerry Lynn. <laughs> John West is so mean to Scott Demore. <laughs> yeah, but, like, he beat the fuck out of him and was throwing him around the ring. Yeah. Like, I, I, I get, like, the idea that was, um, you know, that he had the match with Bobby Reed beforehand at all. But I probably wouldn't have had the manager take 80% of the match. Hmm. It would be like when Raven got James Mitchell in that last man standing match. James Mitchell starts belly to belly suplexing Raven. Yeah. So it's beating his ass. And looking strong while doing it. I was like, God damn, Scott Demore should be on Team Canada. <laughs> Get out of here, Bobby Roode. Scott Demore is the guy to go for. Yeah, Scott Demore should be the muscle of Team Canada. Uh, Lynn eventually made a comeback, started firing up, started beating up Scott Demore. But then Team Canada ran out to cause a DQ win for Jerry Lynn in this five-minute time limit match before Team TNA made the save. Team America. Uh, fuck yeah. <laughs> Uh, later in the show, Chris Daniels cuts a promo. We interrupts the carriage rundown to cut a promo about next week's World X Cup. Yeah, you excited for it? Uh, I thought it was a fun show on the whole. It was better than I think the last two America's X Cup shows. I, I don't know. <laughs> I like bits and pieces of it, but I think I discovered my problem with these shows is that like, despite it being a thing that's been built up for a month, it never feels like they matter at all. And because we we are, we just have another one the next fucking month. Well, this is the last one for a while. Well, good, but, like, that's my point being, being that, like, the lead-up to this, it just feels like they do it, the team wins, and then we just start the whole fucking rigmarole again for the next month. Yeah, and then does the team win again? Yeah, apparently fucking so. It's just, I'm sick of it, man. They're not even fun for me anymore. The first one was fun because it was, like, it was different. And then I it had great wrestling on it. But I feel like if this was a yearly thing, I'd be way more into it because right now it's I'm sick of them. They don't do it for me anymore. You're sick of you just I want to you never want to see freaking Mr. Aguila wrestle again. No, this is the month that I started liking Mr. Aguila or respect. I became a Mr. Aguila respecter this month. Very good. So we have a new format for the World X Cup. It will be a 16 man gauntlet match with three points going to the winning teams and one point going to the runner up. Two tag team matches worth two points each, a four man ladder match worth four points. After three rounds, the team that is placed last is eliminated, and then a three-man Ultimate X worth five points. In the event of a tie, the team captains will face off next week to determine the winner. I like that. You like the new format or the team captains? Both. Tell me about the format. 
I like the format because it isn't like seven tag matches. Mm. It's only two. And it's, we got the we got different things. We got the ladder in there to spice things up. We got the ultimate X to spice things up. The gauntlet was fun. I think if I were to make one tweak, I would replace the gauntlet with a couple of singles. So you'd have the old format. Well, no, well, you'd still have ladders and ultimate X's in there, but I think it would be cool to get like a couple of neat singles between these four cool teams. What if you replace the tags with two singles that go into a third singles with the winners? That, that would not work. Then, the, the one, two, then two teams would have uh, an extra match. Yeah. That's how you eliminate. So there isn't an even out amount of matches because Japan isn't in the finals. But yeah, because the, the elimination is built into the tournament. But if you had two singles that built into another singles, you would have one two teams wrestling one more match than two other well, teams. Clearly they should win. But yeah, there we open with the gauntlet match. So the 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 gauntlet match was Christopher Daniels versus Giant Divine versus Nasawa versus Taichi Ishikari. Yes, again that Taichi, New Japan Pro Wrestling's Taichi, versus Chris Sabin versus Mr. Aguilar versus Petey Williams versus Ryuji Hijikata versus Jerry Lynn versus Heavy Metal versus Mitsu Hirai Jr. versus Bobby Roode versus Abyss Montegro versus Elix Skipper versus Eric Young versus Hector Garza. Yeah, it was fun. They did a bunch of shit. Yeah, my favorite uh, elimination of this uh, entire match was. P.D. Williams eliminating Chris Saban with his, like, roll through Hurricane Rana over the rope. That did rock. And the, the, I liked the story of Japan and Canada are the heels. <laughs> Naturally. And, like, Mexico was, like, the tweeners. And then the, you know, white meat baby face America, fuck yeah, was obviously the other one. But I just, yeah, I liked the, the dynamics in here. And I thought the, the eliminations were fun because they all did some crazy shit. And there was a kid in the front row going off for this. He loved this match. Yeah. Big Mitsu Hirai Jr. fan. Yeah. He's like, this is my moment. That was a a young case low. <laughs> Gave him $10 after the match. <laughs> Mitsu Hirai Jr. There's a fun note that his dad actually worked the National Asylum. So he was, um, or the National Fairgrounds as was known at the time. And he was very like psyched to work the show in the same building that his dad worked. That's adorable. Mm. I'm pretty sure he went by Mitsu Hirai Jr. rather than Nobukazu Hirai, which I think was his name in all Japan, because of that. So it's, uh, he can pay tribute to his dad. That's great. I mean, like, the whole time I was thinking that it would be way cooler if Torimon or <laughs> Noah were this team, but hey, that makes it worth it. Yeah, you get the all Japan representatives here as opposed to... There's not much uh, like other all Japan representation in TNA history. You get a uh, Kiyoshi coming over, but that's about it. Where was the world Japan team? <laughs> Bring back Kenzo. Oh, imagine Kenzo in this. <laughs> Just kicking ass. That sweet gear. Kenzo versus Mr. Aguilar. My favorite part of this match is, is Hichikata and Abismo Negro did the Shatter's dream spots in the corner where he like kicked the turnbuckle and like Abismo just completely no-sold it. I've watched a fair amount of Hichikata in my time. Mm-hmm. I don't ever remember him working so blatantly heel. <laughs> yeah, but he's a, a evil Japanese man. He has to be evil. That's a different guy. Oh, my mistake. That's the King of Darkness. Mm -hmm. He was trapped in a dog cage this week. (laughs) Oh, I saw that. Yeah, I I saw that. It was a good bit. And then they got to do like a thousand uh, triple teams to show to win the match. Mm. Because all of his partners were in a dog cage. (laughs) Poor show. Left by himself. Well, that's what he gets for being a piece of garbage man. A piece of garbage man. (laughs) He is a piece of a man who collects garbage and takes it away for you. Yeah. Final three here were Garza, Skipper, and Young. Garza and Skipper teamed up to eliminate Young, but then we went the final two pinfall submission. Garza caught Skipper in a bridge. So Team Mexico get three points. Team NWA gets one. I really like Garza. He's like clearly TNA have identified him as the star. They keep pushing him. Like he always wins these matches. He's always the guy at the end. He's obviously the captain of the team. And they're like, Hector Garza, this guy's the guy. Yeah. And uh, I agree. They should do something with him well they plan to and then circumstances intervene but we'll talk about that toward the end of the year fun scott hudson interviews team nwa and hudson's like jerry have you already bottled it you're behind <laughs> yeah give a bit of faith also they got one point yeah, it's not like they did like team canada and team japan have no points at the moment yeah he should be uh, given this uh this rundown to nasao out of the question wrong guy <laughs> I, uh, my favorite part was in the ladder match, Mike Tanay is like, I really question Nasawa's decision making here to put Tai Chi in a ladder match. <laughs> Tanay, it's out of the question. Mike Tanay doesn't understand the law. He, he just doesn't understand the deep Noah booking. <laughs> if he did, he, he'd be better off. 
I would love Mike Tanay's opinion on 2022, Noah. I'd imagine he wouldn't like the, the whole great mood of beating everybody thing. I would I would love to hear his breakdown on Nakajima knocking out Tetsuya Endo. Mm. So that brings us to the second round, which is two tag team matches. The first of which is the reuniting Triple X, Christopher Daniels and Neil Skipper, facing Bobby Roode and Johnny Devine. Yeah, uh, it was all right. I thought that was, yeah, I enjoy watching Triple X. I'm glad they're back teaming together. I'm glad they'll be teaming together going forward. I forgot to mention, like, Jerry Lynn, when Scott Hudson was grilling him, when he was like, you're shit, you bottled it already. Jerry Lynn was like, no, I have Triple X, who are former world tag team champions with the best tag teams in company history. They'll be in the tag match. And I have Chris Sabin, one of the my only the only man in this tournament, I think, who has been in an Ultimate X match. He will be in the Ultimate X later tonight. So we're actually looking pretty good here, Scott. That's a good plan. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, watching Triple X. I enjoyed uh, Daniels in particular, I think, is a very good babyface tag team wrestler. Daniels and Divine were flying all over the place in this match. Including Bobby Roode doing a dragon suplex onto Divine, onto Skipper. <laughs> yeah, some crazy stuff here. I really liked all their flips. Yeah, it's good stuff. Johnny Devine took a really gnarly um, throw from the top rope onto hanging himself on the top rope. Mm. And I was like, God, he made some distance on that. Which also perfectly set up Skipper doing the rope walk Rana, which was very neat. It was like a rope walk poison Rana. Yeah. And then they follow with the powerplex to pick up the win. Triple X pick up two points for Team TNA to bring him on to three. Team Canada still on nothing. Yeah. On the verge of being eliminated. Ah, yeah, because the, the, the team that has no points coming out of the ladder match is out, Liam. Mm. Which means Nassauer actually ends up having a very easy night. Yeah, Nassauer is out of the question, and the question is the main event. So Ryuji Hichikata and Mitsuhirai Jr. defeated Heavy Metal and Abysmal Negro to earn two points for Team Japan. Team Mexico always faltering in these tag matches. Yeah, they come out fast, then they lose the tag matches, and then they win in the end. Or do they? <sighs> Don West accidentally said their game plan has gone hirai, and I did chuckle. <laughs> it, it wasn't purposeful wordplay, but it was good wordplay. I'm going to give it to him. Mm. So Bismo had the win, but he wasn't the legal man. Then hirai hit Heavy Metal with an Exploder Suplex for the win. It was a fun little match. I like that they were just beating them up. So after round two, Team AAA, three points. Team NBA, three points. Team Japan, two points. Team Canada, nothing. Team Canada... They're about to get eliminated. And what a stacked match. Jerry Lynn's in the next match. Yeah, so backstage to Hudson, who has Team Canada, and Scott Demore is like, you're letting down 23 million people or whatever it was, and then gives them a big fired up pep talk. Uh, I think Team Canada's going to pull through. Well, they do, as we have a ladder match yeah. in which Eric Young defeats Jerry Lynn, Tai Chi, and Mr. Aguila, and just a wonderful collection of human beings. Uh, Jerry Lynn was trying to cradle pile driver Young off the ladder. Demore hits Lynn with a hockey stick, allowing Young to grab the X and win. Yeah, I thought they were going to do like another big spot after the hockey stick, and it kind of just like was an awkward grab of the thing or whatever. So, yeah, a little weird. Lynn just like slumped down the ladder. <laughs> yeah, I thought like they were going to do a big move to end it, but. The hockey stick is the most devastating force in current TNA. For sure. Actually, that might still be the guitar based on how much AJ bled last week, but... Yeah, it depends. What's, what beats uh, a shoot guitar? We should experiment with that to start hitting people with hockey sticks and guitars to see which causes more blunt force impact. I mean, I'm always down to physically assault people, so... <laughs> uh, I thought these four men worked incredibly oh, hard. They went fucking nuts in this like the crowd was super dead this was actually taped at the very end of one of the tapings so that, like half the crowd had already filed out but like these guys bust their ass in this ladder match eric young man went nuts in this he took so many bumps like the big one is he's like lying on a ladder that's like tilted against the ropes and then mr agwell and jerry lynn just fling the ladder taking eric young from inside of the ring to the outside of the ring in like a catapult motion and then young does like the big flare flop fall on his face and it looks spectacular it's really funny to see this eric young and then the jokerified eric young of now just, like, what different human beings. This is what led to it. All these beatings he took, he's like, I have become the Joker. Mm. That is his Joker origin story. This this catapult launch was where, you know, he said, one day, I will be the one who catapult launches, not be catapult launched. He, he said, uh, this, uh, this catapult launch represents society. <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't, like, in good faith go lower than three and a half just because how hard these poor men worked. Yeah, they killed each other. 
I liked um, the little commentary note in this match about oh, Jerry Lynn very easily could have put himself in the main event as the captain, but decided to make the the strategic play. Yeah, he's just like Chris Saban is the guy with Ultimate X experience. He's won an Ultimate X, so he should be the guy in the Ultimate X match. I'll do the ladder match. See, this is what makes this one probably the second best X Cup that we've had so far. Uh, a, the, the format is better, but also the thing that the other ones have missed that this one has and the first one has was the the show long story. Yeah, especially when the, the like the entire thing for the last like two months has been Jerry Lynn's leadership of Team MDB has been called into question ever since they lost the first America's X Cup, both by Jeff Jarrett and Scott Demore. So here he shows leadership qualities and and his leadership decisions ultimately come up good. Proving the heels wrong. Indeed. So Eric Young wins the match, which gives Team Canada four points, Team NWA three points, Team AAA three points, and then Team Japan have two, so Team Japan are eliminated. Devastating. So our main event is an Ultimate X match, the third Ultimate X in TNA history, as Chris Saban, Petey Williams, and Hector Garza face off five points to the winner, which means whoever wins this wins the entire tournament. I like this one. I thought this one had a cool structure to it, and the addition of... uh... A, a power junior like Hector Garza was not was a nice, uh, different flair from the other ones. I, f- I feel like this was like the smoothest Ultimate X as well. It feels like, you know, especially you have Saban in there who has experience in this match. It feels like they have a better idea of what an Ultimate X should look like and how it should be structured. As opposed to like the first one, which is a little bit just utter chaos, not helped by the fact that the belt fell twice. And the second one, which I had problems with because they introduced a ladder to it for too long. And it's like, well, it's just a ladder match for the middle portion of the match. That's kind of lame. Whereas here, it's like, well, they did a bunch of all the next spots. They did a bunch of falling from cable spots. They did like the tornado DDT thing that PD Williams did from the top of the cables, which is pretty neat. There's a bunch of stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, I think they worked out Ultimate X in this match. Yeah, I think uh, I really enjoyed this one. My favorite thing, my favorite note is just Dave Meltzer in The Observer just talking about the Canadian Destroyer for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> he's been doing it for a while come on Dave yeah, he's done like three or four at this stage but clearly he only noticed it on this show so Dave Williams does this amazing flip pile driver which is appearing on the TNA Impact commercial currently running on FSN which is probably the hottest new move I've seen he starts out in pile driver position with the guy then jumps uh-huh. up into the air with the guy and does a full flip what? ending in a pile driver <laughs> I, st- I just find yeah. the idea of Dave Belter having to explain what a Canadian Destroyer is so funny. <laughs> the most common move of 2020. Mm. This should be used as a finisher, but it's so far just been used as a high spot. It appears to be a move you could do only to a relatively light opponent. Ha ha ha! Dave! Don't you have no fucking clue! <laughs> uh, they are calling the move the Canadian Destroyer, which is in honour of Doug Chevalier. Uh, trainer in the area who passed away in 2000. Chevalier passed away before uh, Williams and Saban started, but trained to more. That's cool. So yeah, Dave is wowed by the Canadian Destroyer. Uh, I was kind of surprised by like, the lack of acknowledgement the Canadian Destroyer has had so far. I feel like if you watched, uh, I think he does it in this match, in the, the Ultimate X, and I think that's the first time but, like both the crowd and the commentary like really put it over strong as like, a death move. Yeah. And like Dave is right, like PD does start using it as his finish from here on out because like just look at the move. Yeah, hundred percent. Especially in the X division, you know. Mm. So that is the World X Cup. As I said, I, I like this tournament. I thought it was better than two of the America's X Cups. I think the first America's X Cup team NWA against Team AAA is still easily the best of these tournaments, but listen. It's probably better than the average weekly pay per view, so I'll take them. Yeah, it's it's the number two, but um I haven't enjoyed the last couple. Mm. The first Super X Cup was also very good last year. Yeah. So that brings us to the world title stuff for the month. Great. <laughs> yeah, the whole story here is that Vince Russo is just God. <laughs> he is God man ruling over all of these minions, but he is constantly conflicted and sad and torn and making like strained faces and he's so just wrought with the decision making. He sucks. I fucking hate him. I hate him. I hate him more than I've ever hated a Vince Russo character. I legitimately, I tweeted this yesterday. I think this baby face Vince Russo authority figure is the worst character in company history. He's just the worst. Ooh. Because, like, I got a couple of replies to that being like, Triton. Triton is funny. You'll get to Triton in 2005. Triton's funny. Uh, you'll get, like, Claire Lynch. Claire Lynch is also pretty funny. Like, she's funny bad. This Vince Russo character, he's just unbearable. 
And one thing I think those people don't get either is those things are bit parts of the show. Mm-hmm. This is 80% of the show. Everything that happens on the show has to go through Vinnie Roo. Which has never, like, not been the case, but it's extra grating now. Yeah, because at least we always acknowledged when, like, the whole show was revolved around sex that Vince Russo, while he was an overbearing character and while the story wasn't particularly good, his delivery was always excellent. Like, he was always, like, a well-delivered, well-performed character. We always gave Vince Russo that credit. Whereas here, for sure, we just see this just mopey git that I cannot tolerate. He's just he's the, he's making this face every time he walks out, where it looks like the weight of the world is on his shoulders because he has to decide whether AJ Styles is facing Chris Harris or Raven this week. And like, never has these has has this decision been more difficult. He can't just say a name. And like, we had the whole show running thing on the road to the cage, which was probably the peak of the worst of it. But it's just his character every week that he's just this git who stands there looking sad all the time. He looks like a cartoon turtle. He does. He's just lost. A lost cartoon turtle. Uh, I don't know, Vince. Uh, uh, this hasn't been good. Uh, he's just kind of annoying more than anything. Every time he appears on screen, he's just annoying. And like, he's trying to be a babyface, but the crowd doesn't like him either. And nobody on the show likes him. And the whole idea is that nobody trusts him. And everyone thinks he's actually a scheming jerk. But he's like, no, I'm a good he's guy. He's not compelling at all in any way. No. You just want his segments to be over once they begin. Mm. Ideally not there in the first place. No. But other than Russo, the whole story this month is that AJ Styles is defending the NWA title basically every week. He defended against Ron Killings last week, last show of April. He won the belt the show before that against Jarrett. So he's in a title match every single week. This week, the first show of the month, NWA TNA number 93. He's defending the belt against Raven. Uh, yeah, I liked the Raven match. I didn't, so I'll start with you. I just thought this match was, like, it's just nice to have two stars go out there and wrestle, and I enjoyed Raven kind of working over the the limbs. This is the only limb Raven match that I've enjoyed so far. Uh, I didn't like the chair stuff that much. Like, anything that involved the, like, cheating wasn't my cup of tea, but I liked the actual in-ring work. I think that overbooking has, like, reached a critical mass this month in particular. Where it's just like, you can't just have AJ Styles babyface having a title defense against Raven. Particularly like the most egregious one is like, you can't just have him having a title defense against Chris Harris. There always has to be bullshit. There's just so much bullshit. And the bullshit usually results in Vince Russo having to make sad faces about how much bullshit there is. And he can't possibly come up with a solution to get rid of all the bullshit. And he gets all sad about it. <laughs> it's really annoying. They're paying off all the bullshit with the King of the Mountain match though, so... Mm. Get to that in a sec. But yeah, I'm, I'm not into this Raven heel run at all. I'm just not into him as a character. I'm not into him as a wrestler, which is, is, is very disappointing because, as, as we've stated many times, we enjoyed Raven a lot in this show so far. Yeah. He was the, the wrestler of the year last year. Yeah, he rocked. Every week we'd come on and be like, oh, Raven's thing this month was the best thing that happened this month. Oh, the show sucked, but Raven was good. Whereas now, like, the show is boring and Raven is boring. He's been dragged down to the level of the rest of the show. With a needless heel turn. That's all it is. They turned him heel. They should never have turned him heel. Honestly, the best thing this month was the Abyss Eric Watts stuff. <laughs> we'll get to that. He and your Eric Watts agenda. I'm not even joking. This is completely unbiased. This is just an objective truth. The best stuff this month was the Abyss Eric Watts stuff. Mm, all right. We'll, we'll get to that when we finish the world title stuff. Can we just skip it? No. So earlier in this show, Scott Hudson was talking to Armando Quintero and La Parca. Yeah. The La Parker. Massive star. Observer Hall of Fame candidate? Mm. I don't think he was... A, I think he was voted in, was he? The, the reason La Parker is here is because this is held on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. So they have La Parker there, except it's not La Parker. Uh, a, a notable name for US television too at this point, WCW and such. Mm. So La Parker's doing a promo and speaking in very broken sounding Spanish before Raven attacked him. <laughs> yeah. It was so rude too. He's like... Uh, thank you for being here. Bah! Yeah, it's like, hey, La Parker, it's nice to see you. Burr, 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 burr. And I was, you know what I was like? I was like, damn, we're getting a cool Raven La Parker feud? That would have been better than what it turned out to be. I was into it. I really wanted it. 
So yeah, the main event we had that Styles and Raven match. Raven pulled out a container of powder. Raven dropped it. AJ threw it in his eyes while also simultaneously eating a super kick. Raven then dropped to hold the ref into a chair because he was blinded. Raven hit AJ with a chair, but there was no ref. Then out comes La Parca. <gasps> I was like, yes. Uh, also, uh, LA Park was inducted in 2018. Good for him. So La Parca drops Raven with a DDT. Styles hits the Styles Clash to retain. Then La Parca reveals himself. He unmasks Liam. <gasps> Turns out, every time you've seen La Parca, it's been Chris Harris all along. Yeah. And um, the other La Parca was, of course, Bobby Roode. They, have, they actually say who it is here. It was played by Harry Del Rios, a.k.a. Spellbinder, according to Wrestling Observer. Hmm. Raven is not a Wrestling Observer Hall of Famer, but, famer by the way. And I don't think he ever will be. Mm. I don't think he's going to make much of a case at this point in his life. Mm. He did just show up at Against All Odds. You never know. You remember uh, WCW also did this angle where I think it was DDP unmasked himself as La Parca? Yeah. He's one of those guys that, that they use for that sort of spot. AEW needs to continue the tradition. Who's the AEW La Parca? It's got to be like someone involved in this Roosh Raven feud, right? Raven? <laughs> Roosh Andrade feud. No, it's how MGF should return. Ooh, I like that a lot, actually. You should have La Parca strut out, hit somebody with a chair, unmask, it's MJF. That'd be great. Uh, so, yeah, La Parca is actually Chris Harris. AMW beat up Raven. The entire locker room comes out. Russo's here. Russo says, Harris is exactly like Raven, but then Harris says, shut up, I want to face AJ. And AJ's like, yeah, sure. And Russo's like, oh, I don't want that match to happen. And then they all brawl to go off the air. Would the King of the Mountain match be better if La Parca was in it? Yes. Who would you take out for La Parca, though? Listen. I know he's the world champion. <laughs> uh, I'll take out Jeff. Yeah, get Jared out of here. Mostly so he can't win. And then LaPaca can win the belt. Mm. That's that's the way to come to TV. So that brings us to our next show, NWA TNA Baby number 94, May 12th, 2004, in which the main event, Chris Harris finally gets the title shot he earned months ago against AJ Styles. And he finally proves everyone right by winning the... Oh no, the MS says here he lost? <laughs> that seems very silly. Well, you know, it makes sense. Maybe they want AJ to go on a big run heading into TV. Oh, no, Liam. AJ loses the belt next week. Wait, what? Mm. That's okay. Maybe, you know, he'll win it back on the first impact or something. Oh, yeah. That's what's going to happen in, in June. That's, you know, yes. Oh, no. Your inflection on your voice makes me feel like he's not going to beat Ron Killings for the title on the first impact show. So, it's funny. There's a pre-match promo before this where Styles is like, a good tag team wrestler but can you cut it as a heavyweight wrestler it's like AJ they just did that with you <laughs> yeah that's the point he's a baby face he shouldn't be a hypocrite he's a dickhead he's not he's a baby face also I don't know who said that promo right then that doesn't sound anything like AJ Styles you're a tag team <laughs> whoa they, they had a match I thought the match was frequently pretty good when there was no bullshit yeah, so there. I mean, it's two good wrestlers who are dynamic and can do some crazy shit. Yeah, so Vince Russo came up with the wonderful idea. So there's been outside interference in all of these matches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaning back because it's great. Oh, I have a mic that can move now. I can actually do this. So Vince Russo has this miraculous idea that instead of just simply banning people from ringside, as perhaps a normal, rational person might do, Vince Russo has concocted a master plan. <laughs> Where he will have Raven and Ron Killings handcuffed to the turnbuckles, to the posts. Where they could never get involved, right next to the ring. Right next to the ring, within reach of the ring and the ropes and the top rope, where they could not possibly interfere in the match. And the wrestlers! This is Vince Russo's master plan. Raven interferes immediately. Yeah, Vince Russo's a fucking idiot. Then Conan runs out, cuts Ron Killings free with bolt cutters. Which actually rules. It took him ages too. He was like, nur, 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 and it wouldn't break. It was good stuff. We've also been having a ton of 3LK stuff in the lead up to this. Yeah, we'll talk about that in the lead up to the um, the, the match next week. Because it's mostly, it's more Vince Russo stuff and I hate it. So Truth then interferes on AJ for a while before Don Harris comes out and he boots Conan and Killings. 
Harris hits the catatonic, but then Raven pulls the referee out. Raven then grabs the key from the referee, unlocks his cuffs. He hits Harris with a chair. He was about to do the chair arm thing he did to Harris, where he stomps on his arm while he, his arm is lying on the chair. He did that a few weeks ago. But then Sabu comes out. If you remember, Raven has a contentious relationship with Sabu now, because Raven basically abandoned his tag team partner. Sabu makes the save. Kid Cash runs out, hits Harris with a pipe, which Styles falls with a discus lariat to retain. Then Raven hits Styles with a chair, but then Harris spears Raven but then killing said drops Harris all the locker room comes out Russo books a four way between the four for next week for the title I mean it was chaotic but I liked where it ended up yeah like there was like a five minute stretch here where AJ and Harris just had a match and it was really good and there was some great near falls and the crowd like honestly bid on like an elbow drop for some reason the crowd really likes that Chris Harris elbow drop they always think it's a finish it's a good elbow you can just thank Macho Man for that I guess mm-hmm but yeah, they, they, I thought the match was good when it was good and the rest was the rest. Yeah, that's fair. You can say that about literally every match on this month, but... All right, end of the 18th, number 95, May 19th, Vince Russo has a new plan. He has banned a specific <laughs> list of people from ringside. <laughs> Couldn't possibly just ban everyone. He has banned James Storm, Kid Cash, Dallas, 3 Live Crew, and Sabu from ringside in our deadly draw four-way main event in which Ron Killings, Chris Harris, AJ Styles, and Raven face for the NWA title. So those specific people cannot interfere. Perhaps somebody else can. Uh, that's insane. This is Vinny Rue. He's incompetent. Just, no, I mean, like, that would never happen. Mm, nobody nobody would ever interfere with a, an NWA world title match. That, it's just the stakes are too high. It was too, like, credible. Yeah, of a, everyone has too much respect for the title. You would never undermine the credibility of the championship. Especially heading to television. So as you mentioned, we we had this Ron Killing story running through the month. This, this, this Tree LK feud with Vince Russo, where they, they basically feel like Vince Russo is, is slighting Ron in favor of his boy AJ. And the, the weird thing about all this is too, is like, the way it's presented is that they're all being heels, mm-hmm. and but the crowd still loves Ron Killings and wants him to be champion, and so none of it comes off well well you see i think they're meant to be baby faces it's just they're not particularly likable i don't think they are meant to be baby faces they're being uh, like objective dickheads they're <laughs> definitely meant to be like they're booked against heels they're meant to be baby faces it's just they don't understand what makes people likable so here we are but like they're fighting vince russo who is also a baby face but is he that's the whole thing is he oh uh, i hate it all it hurts my brain why can't this just be jurassic world domination <laughs> It doesn't make your brain hurt. It's too nuanced. It's too artful. So yeah, there's a segment at the start of the month of Trail K demands a title shot. Russo's like, no, you don't get one. Then Monty comes out, demands a title shot. He's like, no, nobody gets a title shot. Then they brawl. So Monty is feuding with Trail K as well with the idea that Trail K think Monty is Russo's guy trying to take them out, I think. Monty's like barely around. <laughs> yeah. So then Russo kicks Trail K out of the building. But then we find that Vince Russo's office has been trashed later that night, Liam. Did we ever find out who did that? <laughs> not yet. Hmm. I'm not sure do we ever, but we haven't found out yet. <laughs> do we know who actually does it? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember, no. <laughs> hmm. What if it was Jerry Jarrett? Yeah, he's like, that's what caused his heart attack. He's like, he got too wound On the way up. out, he was like, he was just kicking shit over. He's like, fuck you, if I'm going out, so is your office. So the next show of the month, Monty Brown faced BG James. <laughs> Uh, what a funny match. <laughs> it wasn't a terrible match. No, it wasn't bad. It's just like you see Monty Brown versus BG James on your screen and you're like, what am I watching? So they brawl all the way out into the crowd. Like every Monty Brown match at the moment? Yes, yeah, so like every TNA match. You need to walk and brawl in the crowd. And they set up a table underneath the balcony and Monty Brown teases throwing BG off it. And I'm like... Never in a million years is BG James taking a balcony bump through a table. No, and he doesn't. There is no tease in wrestling history that I have believed less than this tease of throwing BG James off a balcony. Listen, I have to watch Don Fuji threatening to throw someone off the cork and hole balcony like twice a month. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I still believe that more than I believe BG James (laughs) taking this bump. Uh, BG is never taking any bump. He doesn't like to do wrestling. So, like, why would I believe this? Yeah, and in fact, not only does he not take the bump, he in fact ends up powerbobbing Monty through that table. So, 
BJ always wins. Uh, Monty crotches BG on the rail and then starts hitting his leg with a chair a few times. Then Monty hits a pounce and wins. The idea Monty has attacked his knee and perhaps taken out BG James. <laughs> I'm just remembering the promo that BG cut later when he's on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, he wouldn't do that. Oh, he wouldn't go that low. Because they have later in the show, he's backstage. Hudson has 3LK and, and BG and like Ron's mad and Conan is like, Russo did it. And yeah, BG's like, no, no, he wouldn't do that. He's my friend. He wouldn't do that. <laughs> he's like, and he moves so sharply like a robot. Just like, no, he wouldn't do that. No. Also in TNA canon, hasn't Vince Russo fired BG from sex before? Uh, yeah, but that was just a firing, not to an attempt at taking out his fucking leg. Hmm. That's a that's a gentle firing. So I know TNA officials are said to be very high on Monty Brown, which explains his recent winning streak. Dutch Mantel is said to be the office worker most soundly behind Brown, although he's not alone in the office when it comes to the opinion that Brown is a future main eventer. Brown is well liked in most locker room circles, although a number of wrestlers think he is too green for the push he's receiving. Ah, uh, wrestlers. They're just jealous. They look at him and he's like, he's too cool and he has too much charisma. We have to take him down. Yeah. So all that BG bullshit, all that Conan bullshit, all that Russo bullshit brings us to the main event of the May 19th show in which Ron Killings defeats Chris Harris, AJ Styles and Raven in a deadly draw match to become the new NWA world champion. It was alright. We have, once again, for reasons beyond comprehension, made an NWA world title change all about Vince Russo. I mean, uh, rough. Are you surprised? There's like a bunch of notes this month, which I didn't include because I do not believe them. That's like, oh, Russo doesn't, <laughs> Russo doesn't have that much booking power these days. It's like, fuck you, watch the television show. Yeah, like, well, no one else likes him. Like, in the booking office, so. There's literally a show about an unlikable character who puts himself all over television. He clearly has some power. But also, like, it's not like he has people on his side anymore. Mm. He stabbed Jared in the back a million times. Jerry doesn't like him. Dutch Mantel isn't his guy. He's just a man on an island trying to become a minister. So, I don't know. It seems like there's one person with booking power who, who would be putting him out there every second of the fucking show. <laughs> Making his big mopey face. I hate him. So yeah, the structure of this match is a new TNA stipulation. They called it the Deadly Draw. So two men started spacing a little gauntlet gimmick. Should call it the Deadly Dander. <laughs> Deadly Danda should have won the Deadly Draw. Ooh. So two men start, they do a five minute interval, then Raven came out, it was Harrison Styles that started, then five minute interval, then Killings came out, and then whoever scored the ball won. So it was a little staggered entry four way, basically. I would have preferred pin uh, eliminations, but I guess then we have to pin three of our biggest stars. Mm, as opposed to just pinning AJ. <laughs> now, normally the rules of a four way are done in a way in which you don't have to pin the champion. No. Nah. AJ, because they already pinned Harris and Raven this month. They couldn't possibly pin them again. But they're all in fuck finishes that don't matter. <laughs> it's all fuck finishes that don't matter. Speaking of... So if you remember, Russo had his list of people that were banned from ringside, but not included on that list was Jeff Jarrett. Which seems like a huge oversight. He really didn't think that one through, because Jeff has been laying low. He's been gone this month. This is, you know, Russo thought he'd just finally draw him out. You should always assume that Jeff Jarrett's around, though. <laughs> Hovering somewhere with a guitar ready to hit somebody. That is his, uh, his modus operandi. You should recut the opening of the Batman. You know, it's like, in the shadows, I'm waiting. And they were scared of the shadows, except it's Jeff Jarrett in the shadows wearing his, like, cowboy hat black getup thing <laughs> with his guitar ready to hit anybody. Chomp in the way. It's just, Jeff Jarrett is the Batman, except he has a guitar. Jeff Jarrett is the bad man. He's the guitar man. The guitar man. So Jarrett comes out, he hits Styles with a guitar, which is like a shoot guitar shot. That Styles bl blade job is not a blade job. He was busted open by that guitar. Cool. Uh, Harris had Styles beaten, but then Killings pulled the referee out. Raven clotheslined both himself and Harris over the ropes. Killings hits a top rope axe kick on Styles. Which looks awesome. Yeah, great finish. To become NWA champion for a second time. But then we couldn't just have a celebratory moment. Couldn't just be like, oh, the truth has won the belt again. Everyone's very happy that the truth has won the belt again. Nah, has to be about Vinny Roo. Vinny Roo comes out, he grabs the title, he's, he looks all mad, he's making his face again. Am I gonna allow this? <laughs> the, the story can't be that Ron Killings earned the NWA title. It has to be 
Vince Russo allows him to be NWA champion. I don't care for this Vince Russo guy. I mean, it, hot take, but I think this guy sucks. <laughs> And I don't want him on my fucking television. And more importantly, actually, I'd argue, I don't want him booking the fucking television. Just keep him away from professional wrestling in general, I would say. Yeah, keep him on some dopey podcast. That nobody has to listen to. Yeah, only huge losers do them anyway. Nobody does podcasts. <laughs> in 2022? This isn't a podcast, this is a higher form of art. Uh... This is an audio experience. Sorry, this is a conversation series. This is a, a conversation with our best friends. Yes. Hello, best friends. How are you doing? Now with the, now with the, now with your best friend. So yeah, Russo decides that the decision will stand and that Ron Killings is the new NWA world champion. Great. Glad we needed that three minutes. Ron Killings didn't find out until the day of the show that he was winning the NWA title. He was said to be frustrated when wrestlers warned him that his title reign would likely be a short one since everybody expects Jeff Jarrett to win the title either before the show debuts or FSN shortly thereafter. I'm sad. And they're right. He has a two-week title reign. Hey, spoilers. I won't even pretend to have Jeopardy that Jarrett wins the belt back in King of the Mountain. Well, you know, he is King of the Mountain, so... Uh, and then AJ Styles was upset with Jeff Jarrett because the cut he received from Jarrett's guitar, although Styles calmed down quickly, wrestlers point out that Jarrett has a history of being reckless with guitar and chair shots. One incident that wrestlers recalled was when Jarrett split D'Lo open with a chair on a TNA pay-per-view. I'm sorry that brother wants to lay it in. <laughs> I am the Jeff Jarrett defender. He's the he's just I have this, logged on. this shooter. He just wants to make it convincing. He's a good wrestler. Mm. As we know, good wrestling is when you actually hurt the person. When you bust them open. It was a pretty sick blade job as well. He was bleeding a lot. I feel like we shouldn't say blade job. Yeah, wrong word. Shoot blood. <laughs> Hard way. Shoot blood, baby. That's an extra half star right there. It is the, ro the rule of professional wrestling. It is the law. So, during the World X Cup show, last show of the month, Jeff Jarrett comes out, he grabs Mike Tanay, drags him to the ring, and he's like, I want confirmation that I'm getting my title rematch. I want it on June 2nd. And Mike, confirm it. You're the witness. Russo comes out, and he's like, you will get your title shot. And Jarrett's like, ha ha ha, I get my title shot. But then Russo's like, it won't just be you. Ha ha ha, I'll get my title shot. It'll be you versus Truth versus Raven versus Styles versus Harris in the first ever King of the Mountain match. I'm excited. And also, people like to pretend the King of the Mountain match is that complicated. It's really not. It does take Vince Russo over a minute to explain the rules. Yeah, it's because Vince Russo sucks. Mm. Garrett. Yes. The King of the Mountain match is when five people, currently, I don't know if it gets any more at some point, but when five people are in the ring, they have to win, they have to get a pinfall to be eligible to put the fucking thing on the fucking hook, alright? If you get pinned, you go on the penalty box for two minutes and you can come back out and join the match again. That's really complicated, sorry, I can't understand it. I'm just saying that TNA is obviously for galaxy brain people <laughs> and you're a fucking dullard if you don't get it. Do you want to know why I think people find it confusing? Because they're dumb? No, I think in practice, it's hard to keep track in your head of who's eligible. And I think that would be solved like with a simple put a graphic on the screen. The actual match itself, like, it's probably way more complicated than the rules. Because mm. like the, the only thing, the only thing that makes it complicated, I really do think the only thing that makes it like difficult to keep track of while you're watching it is that you just forget who scored pinfalls. And if they just put that on the screen, there's like, this person's eligible, and you can see it at all times that, like, Jeff Jarrett's eligible or Chris Harris is eligible. I think that would literally just solve all the complicated problems. That'd be cool, actually. You could do little, like, um, WWE 2K games where they have, like, the names down the bottom, and they have, like, a little finisher thing, but you could just make that, like, a little green bit that you tick off when they are eligible. Yeah, a little traffic light system. They all have a little red light, and it turns green when they're eligible. That'd be cool. Or a physical podium that shows that. <laughs> <laughs> or a bunch of people at ringside who have cards that like, have the name on them, but they're in red when they're not eligible and they turn it around. <laughs> There's five people standing ooh, for the ooh, Garrett, what you could do is too, when um, if they have like little 2K graphics on the screen system, mm -hmm. you could gray the people out when they're in the penalty box. Oh, very nice. That's very fancy. Yeah. Russo begins explaining the rules and Jared just shouts, that'll never work. <laughs> I like that he kept cutting him off, and Russo's like, let me fucking say the rules! Yeah. He was like, I'm very visibly frustrated that Jared kept cutting him off. Because <laughs> he was like, trying to remember them. Mm. So we will have the debut of King of the Mountain on the first show of June. I'm excited. And that's your world title picture for the month. We have a new NWA champion. It's Ron Killings. 
the truth. So we have another bunch of bits and bobs, none of them like particularly substantial programs, but the biggest is probably the Kit Cash and Dallas against Dusty Rhodes and James Storm feud that runs through the month. All right, let's get that. Then we'll hit everything else and end with Watson Abyss. <laughs> Main event, baby. Yeah, well, that's the reason we're here. We've got to end it hot, you know? What are we going to end it with? Fucking Shane and the franchise with their one segment? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> hey, they had a match and Shane's gone. <laughs> Cool, I'll, I'll, I'll read out that, that bit now. <laughs> so, Scott Hudson was backstage in Russo's locker room when he found that it was trashed. And then he was like, I think Trio K did it. But then Kid Cash walked in and he's like, actually, James Storm did it. Yeah, and he was like really mean to him too. Mm. He was like, Storm sucks and I hate him. And next time I see Storm, I'm going to beat the shit out of him. Then Storm walks into the room. <laughs> yeah, that was um, not smart. He also walked through a fucking like APA door. Yeah, it's it's a sex locker room they're in. Were they? It was the sex locker room. <laughs> it just looked like there was a random door frame. <laughs> yes, uh, Cash said, next time I see Storm, I'm going to beat him up. Storm walked in, then Cash ran away. This guy's a coward. Chase into the arena, Cash and Dallas tried to double team Storm, but then Storm got away. <sighs> I don't really have much to say about this feud. It's kind of boring. There's just a bunch of stuff happening. They have a match the next week. It's James Storm against Kid Cash. It's perfectly fine. I thought that was a little fun match. My favorite part is Mike today on commentary mentions that you see the tape over Kid Cash's shoulder. He's been bitten by a spider. Oh. Well, he was poisoned since birth. That's true. He attracts spiders. It's not infecting him with poison. It's trying to take the poison out. Is Kid Cash the Spider-Man? Oh, maybe he is. Maybe that's why he's so agile and nimble. Mm, that would make sense. <laughs> Wait, maybe he was bitten by arachnid. <laughs> what? Whatever the fucking trinity... <laughs> Gimmick was. Oh, yeah, the mass luchador. Yeah. I don't think it ever had a name like Arachnid, but I'll allow it. <laughs> I thought it was a spider. Might today even specified it was a brown recluse. That sounds bad. But yeah, he's wrestling. Did you get bit by spiders? I don't think so. I occasionally have insect bites, but I don't know what bit me. I don't remember ever actively being bitten by a thing that I saw what bit me. Uh, I can, you can tell. I am not able to identify different insect bites. I'm not from the Australian outback. I'm sorry, my Australian is showing, but <laughs> yes, um, I've been bitten by spiders many a time, and I can always tell, because they suck, and they last for days. We only have small spiders. They're itchy, and they go hard, and it's gross. Ugh. This is why I don't live in a hellscape. I googled when was the last time an Australian uh, had died <laughs> to a spider bite. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was ever a recorded case. Well, like, not since, like, the 60s. There's surely something. Not in Australia. Very good spider bite maintenance. Well, we're probably prepared for it more than most. So Cash faces Storm. Storm hit the eight second ride. Dallas distracted the referee. Cash tried to hit Storm with the pipe shaped nightstick, but then Storm got it there first with a <laughs> super kick. Dallas then jumped him, hit the blackout, followed by a Cash frog splash. Dilo made the save. Well, he tried to make the save, but then Chris Harris and Dusty ultimately made the save. I forgot that Chris Harris was even involved at this point. It took him ages to make that save. They were beating the shit out of Storm, and then D'Lo came out, and then they were beating the shit out of D'Lo, and then Harris came out like five minutes later. Where was Sonny Siaki? Not Sonny Siaki. Where was fucking the other guy? <laughs> what other guy? Oh, Apollo? Apollo. <laughs> uh, apparently, he's working a lot of uh, Puerto Rican dates and can't make it at the moment. It's just, I just realized that Apollo looks like if Sanasiaki was blown up with like a helium tank. He does. He kind of does. He just inflate the man. If he was just like, if you went into a Photoshop and you just dragged him out left and right, <laughs> you get Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Harris and Dusty made the save. Dusty Rhodes is back for the first time since December. It's like not in a big shocking way, you know. He just kind of showed up. Well, they do explain that he is there as like sage advice for Chris Harris. That's the only reason he's there. He's like an advisor to hype Harris up for the title match that he has on this show. But then he comes out to help James Storm and gets involved in that story. Well, he's a friend of AMW, as James Storm said. Is he one of America's most wanted? Oh, he was only he was only referred to as a friend. It's true. They're pals. They're buddies. But maybe this but maybe this potential for something a little more. Friendships can blossom into something else. Being a stable, of course. <laughs> yes, nothing else. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes made it known backstage last week that he wasn't happy that he hadn't heard from anybody in the office in months. Rhodes felt nothing else TNA officials could have called to say that they wouldn't be booking him for a while. Yeah, fucking keep Dusty up to date. Don't leave Dusty hanging. He's Dusty. He was the best part of your show in 2003 other than Raven. It's also Dusty Rhodes. Have a bit of respect. Mm, so Dusty interrupts the on-camera plug for next week, the classic format, and then cuts a promo where he will face Kid Cash in Dallas with his pal James Storm in a bunkhouse brawl. 
American Dreams Most Wanted. He did a very good bit where he took his boots and hat off and then put his hat in his boots and said, this is Kid Cash because he's a tiny puny man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good cartoon. Uh, it was a good image. And he like laid down on the mat next to the boots and the hat and like, hey, tiny Kid Cash, how do you feel about this? Kid Cash don't get no puffy. <laughs> So the next week, we have... Du- <laughs> that last little callback there, gotcha. Yeah, we have Dusty and Storm against Kit Cash and Dallas in the Bunkhouse Brawl. Cool. They work a very traditional, normal tag, get the heat, get the heat forever. Dusty actually never makes a proper hot tag. He's cut off, like, twice. Yeah. I like this match, actually. Yeah, it was a good little tag match. Good finish. You just have the inherent charisma of Dusty that just makes everything good. Yeah. Also, James Storm in a tag match. That also, and he's babyface in peril for pretty much the entire match, too, which he's very good at. And a great finish. So yeah, they're, they're, they're working over Storm throughout the match, and that involves like working over his leg and his ankle, and in that process, they take off his boot, so he doesn't have the boot for the last call. So Dusty's brawling out on the floor with Dallas. He takes out Dallas, then throw, takes off his own boot, throws it to Storm. Storm puts on Dusty's boot, hits the last call, picks up the win for himself and, and Dusty. It's one of those fun little facts that you can say Lance Archer worked with Dusty Rhodes. Yeah. And had some good matches in the process. It's a fun little uh, little connection there. So Storm and Dusty, by virtue of beating the tag team champions, have earned a tag team title shot on the first show of June. But what about the rankings? There, There is no rankings. There's no other tag teams this month. <laughs> Literally none. <laughs> this is the full division. There is not a single other thing to talk about in the tag team division other than these handful of matches between James Storm and Kid Cash, Dusty Rhodes, and Dallas. Listen, I don't know what happens, but... I hope James Storm and Dusty Rhodes win the tag titles so I can have that fun fact of James Storm being a tag champion with Dusty Rhodes. Well, you will see what happens in June. I will. So then there's a bunch of other small stuff. Let's start with Amazing Red and Sanjay Dutt have a best of three series this month to determine the number one contender. I don't think there has ever been a greater gap between what something should be on paper versus what it turned out to be in execution. (laughs) These are all fun matches, but they just weren't great. I thought the first one was pretty bad, if I'm honest. I liked the first one because they just did uh, some technical grabs. Yeah, they went out there and they just exchanged holds. And it's like, it's Sanjay and Amazing Red. Sanjay and Amazing Red. You know what I think? I think if they had of put this as the second match mm. and had the second match as the first match. And I, I think it actively sabotaged the second match where they do start doing flips and shit. And the crowd just don't care because the crowd do not give a shit about them exchanging holds. In fact, Don West on commentary is like, you know, Mike, I think this crowd is in stunned silence because they didn't expect all this technical wrestling from these guys. It's like, yes, Don, I think that is the case. Yeah, I I think, yeah, just making this the second match would have helped a lot. And like they even like fuck up a tornado DDT and then for some reason they show a replay of it. There were some weird replays on this uh, month. Well, like one of the like most generic uh, Battle Royal eliminations in the gauntlet. Mm. They just did a replay, and I was like, "Really?" Well, that was a taped show, so maybe that's covering something f- that they fucked up. They did the half and oh half, yeah, they do picture in picture replays. Yeah, so yeah, never mind. <laughs> I thought that was like such an odd choice, which makes it all the more baffling when it's a taped show. I don't know. You know, these things happen. Yeah, shit happens. So yeah, the that first match, yeah, Sanjay won with a cradle. Again, yeah, I think this would have made way more sense to have Sanjay win with the cradle after the technical match in the second match of the series and having Amazing Red win in the flippy one. So yeah, you, you then tell the story that like they tried to go flip for flip and Red was better, so Sanjay had to bring something different. Yeah, had to slow him down and bring him to the ground. And then one with a, with a technical move, you know? I don't think it helped either that like they came out, they were about to wrestle, and then Frankie's music hit, which is just it just kind of undermines them from the start. Which I guess was the point of the whole thing. Hmm... Like that Frankie's undermining them by making putting all the attention on himself. But these two aren't currently big enough stars in this company to be able to be undermined. Oh, that's a real sad thing to say about Amazing Red. And he only just returned, but it is true. And they both had bad gear. Ah, oh, no, they have baggy pants. It's rules. Baggy, don't, I don't, I don't like your anti-baggy pants agenda. I mean, it's bad. I also just said it to get you to get fired up. <laughs> baggy shiny pants are my favorite kind of gear. Which is insane but sure uh may 12th we had the second match red won this time he had a red star press after a red spike red everything all red everything and he has the red eye and the infrared amazing red should have uh trained eva marie (laughs) so she could also have move names that are called red well she was all red everything remember when she came back and she was purple (laughs) i forgot she came back at all that was wild that was wild that's a weird one yeah 
Huh. Frankie was out at the opening bell again of this one. In a comical error, a Minnesota cable company's preview listing for the TNA show advertised Amazing Red versus Sanjay Mott. He should have come out dressed as a dog. Russo probably would have loved that. He would have gotten into it. He would have got a push then. <laughs> he probably would have. <laughs> and then run it back one more time. Third match in the best of three series. Amazing Red defeats Sanjay to become number one contender. He hits the red eye to pick up the win. Frankie was on commentary for a while and also sat at ringside. Then Kaz shook his hand. He was kind of condescending. Then Red kicked him out of the ring, pulls with the belt. Yeah, it's actually a good little diversion because you thought for sure Frankie was going to be the one to do it. Mm, or a writer smart. Or just a dickhead. One or the other. Because Frankie could have just been a nice guy. He could have actually been sincerely applauding his effort in this best of three series. He could have been like, you know what? I've been ringside for all three of these matches and you've actually legitimately impressed me. When they say he's the coolest ever, they just mean that he's a really cool guy. Mm. Not that, like, he's being cool. Like, he's just a cool dude to be around. He's just a nice fella. Very supportive. <laughs> that should have been his uh, his nickname instead. <laughs> the nice fella, Frankie Kazarian. Yeah. You guessed it. It's the nice fella, Frankie Kazarian. <laughs> Every time. they I, That seems like a burial. Yeah. There's no way they do that to, like, earnestly get him over. Mm. Uh, Garrett, do you want to do a quick review of the Frankie Kazarian Chris Saban impact match that's getting a lot of hype? Yeah, I, I was actually going to mention that like on the first show of this month, Frankie mentions the line, I'm the future and the future looks good, which is the first time he says that line in TNA, I believe. And when he did the challenge for the final match against Chris Saban, he said that line again, I'm the future and the future looks good. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but yeah. Yeah, they had a really good match, a nice finale. And it's more or less 18 years to the day or 19 years of the day, in fact, since their first match as well. So it was a nice little full circle thing. And if you saw, there's a, a very nice, like, digital exclusive put out in the Impact Twitter the other day, which is just Frankie just hyping up Chris Sabin, which he closed with saying that Chris Sabin is the future. Because he is, because Chris Sabin is the best. It's time to strap him up again. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be talking about that match in more detail in, like, 10, 15 years. <laughs> when we get around to it. We need, we need Impact to, like, I don't know, get bored out or something at some point, just so we can have an end point to this. It's going to keep running forever. Forever. So Amazing Red is your new number one contender for the Exhibition Championship. You will face Frankie on the first show of June. This first uh, June show is lining up to be a big one. Yeah, they read, like Mike Tanay has even like, branded it as the Night of Champions. Well, stealing from NXT. <laughs> yes, NXT invented the Night of Champions. Yep, that's, uh, that's the only place I know it from. Not the WWE pay-per-view of the same name. Or perhaps WCW? Yeah, but w WCW doesn't exist to me. So. Mm. I'm talking 2008, WWE, Night of Champions, Kofi Kingston beating Chris Jericho. Was that a good match? That feels like it was a good match. It might have been the other way around. It was right after the draft, after Kofi got put to the Raw roster. <laughs> it's so stupid that this is my knowledge base. I was about to say, I like you having a needlessly detailed memory of like late 2000s WWE just because that's when you grew up watching it 2008 to like 2012 is my to like that's like the part where I will I will correct people on things if you were to be on an episode of five star match game it's like that's your window yeah that would be my era they'll be like WWE title challenges from 2008 and I'm like Vladimir Kozlov didn't 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 it might have been 09 yeah, so Night of... I actually found it. It was the first Chris Jericho vs. Kofi Kingston match that came up on Cage Match. Mm. I wanted to see who won. Night of Champions 2008. What a card this is. Go on. Miz and Morrison defeat Finley and Hornswoggle for the WWE Tag Team titles. Oh <laughs> Dark Match. Jeff Hardy defeats MVP. Probably going to be better than anything on the show. Matt Hardy defeats Chavo Guerrero with Bam Neely. Nine minutes. Oh. This was... I love this match as a kid. Eight minutes. Mark Henry defeats Kane and The Big Show to win the ECW Heavyweight title. No. World Tag Team title match. One-on-two handicap match. Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase defeat Hardcore Holly in one minute. Obviously, the story going in here was that Ted DiBiase had a mystery partner that no one knew about, and it turns out that it was Cody Rhodes in the night and the big betrayal of Hardcore Holly. Cody Rhodes technically beat himself that night. Mm-hmm. Intercontinental title match. Kofi Kingston defeats Chris Jericho with Lance Cade in 11 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Mickey James defeats Katie Lee with Paul Birchall in 7 minutes for the WWE Women's title. I miss when Paul was a pirate. You, you didn't like incest Paul? I'm surprised Paul hasn't popped up anywhere since he left WWE. I liked Paul. He's just like, I'm done. I thought he was a good wrestler. As a kid, I enjoyed him. Because like the standing Spanish fly was like his move. It was like his big C4 exploder. That was the thing that made him cool. Remember when he was Jack Sparrow? Yeah. That was a weird time. 
Uh, Garrett, so the World Heavyweight title match and the WWE Heavyweight title match on this show are the most World Heavyweight title match and WWE Heavyweight title matches possible. Mm-hmm. I would like you to have a chance at guessing them. Randy Orton versus John Cena. You are so close. Damn. Triple H defeats John Cena for the WWE Heavyweight title. Of course. And the world title match? Edge and Undertaker. Oh, I feel like there were three answers for both and you hit one on each. Yeah. It was Edge defeats Batista yes. for the world heavyweight title. That's crazy because like Edge, Batista and The Undertaker just wrestled each other for a year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like that was just a thing. Then of course on the other brand you had Triple H, John Cena and Randy doing the exact same thing. 2008 retrospective coming soon. Remember when that company had stars? <laughs> Garrett, do you know what the buy rate of this show was? What? Two hundred and seventy three thousand. Which honestly was probably considered a disappointing number at the time. Yeah, which is now like insane. If AEW did that number, people would be literally dancing in the streets. I would be dancing in the streets. I don't even have like that much investment and I would be dancing in the streets. <laughs> it's not your money. Could be. Next up, Desire and Trinity continue their feud this month. Um, yeah. See the problem with this is it's bad and I don't care about it. Mm-hmm. But Desire is such a genuine person that I want to see her succeed. Yeah. And I enjoyed them fighting in a park. Which might have been the highlight of the month. I mean, no, that was Scott Damore beating the fuck out of Jerry Lynn. But I, it's, a, it's a fine number two. Actually, the number one might be Goldilocks' voice messages. Don't No, we're not there yet. I'm just saying. So we had a feature about Desire versus Trinity on the first show of the month. And Siaki was like, I'm not sure you should be doing the match. We are acknowledging openly that they are a couple together now. Yeah, well, even um, they asked. He's like, what is your relationship? And she's like, we've been dating for like six months or whatever. I think it was like 18 months, a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. Sure, that's about the same. Then they had a match. Everybody was sent to the back. Trinity won with a roll-up. Sure. I like this Trinity stuff. She actually feels like a big deal. Again, we've talked about that a lot. That it, feel, it really does feel like they dropped the ball with Trinity in particular as someone who felt like a star before sex and in, in the early ages of sex. And then... Stupid sentences. Uh, and then... Um, Trinity felt like a star at the start of sex, but by the end of it... <laughs> by the end of sex, she just felt like a weird cog in a wheel that was weirdly tied to Disco Inferno. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> There's many weird images that are popping in your head right now. I'm sorry. So the dis- the disco part really threw me for a loop. So Trinity jumped Desire after the bell, was going to moonsault Desire. She put a chair in her back and was going to moonsault the chair onto her back, but Siaki made the save. That's the classic lay him on the trampoline finisher. <laughs> moonsault onto a chair? You put the the weapon on top of them so that you feel it. So it feels like you've actually done something different than a regular move. Because <laughs> it hurts you more? Yeah. Because otherwise you wouldn't know. I used to, like, drape my Plastic World title belts over them. After the match, Swinger and Gilberti attacked Irish Pat Kenny. Enough about your nonsense. <laughs> Outside the building. We'll get to some... I'm about to attack Irish Garrett Kidney. I'm going to lay the title belts over you and then I'm going to... Just shout you're just a lousy Irishman at me? <laughs> I'm going to pour green paint on you. Yeah, so they said he smells like an Irishman after pouring some beer on him. And then... Ha! Poured green paint on him. Ha! Huh? Because he's Irish and they hate him. They put, uh, they put green soap in his mouth. Classic Irish. It's, there's a funny note because I had no idea what that soap was. I'm like, is that an Irish stereotype that I'm not aware it's gotta of? It's got to be an Irish American thing, right? Yeah, because there's a note. It's Irish spring soap. I heard Don West mention it. It's like, oh, they're putting Irish spring soap in his mouth. And there's literally a line on the Wikipedia page for Irish spring. It's like, Irish spring isn't sold in Ireland. And most Irish people have never heard of it. You should um buy some Irish spring and do a review for the Patreon. Yeah, see, it's a good soap. So the problem with like this, right? Soap? If, no. <laughs> if they were to do this exact angle with an Australian... They would just pour the, like, red, white, and blue on him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it it would kind of lose some luster because they'd be like, it's just the American colours too. I think they might go for, like, gold for Australian, maybe. Green and gold? Yeah. Our sports colours? Our fighting kangaroo? Be more distinct? Yeah. Well, I argue that we should have the green and gold as our actual flag. Not to get political again. Wow. Political Liam Jones with his Australian right-wing views. I don't know if it's (laughs) right-wing to say that I would like to be separate from the... (laughs) royal family <laughs> it's extremist positions from liam jones here so next show pat kenny's outside the building and he's like i want to fight the nyc i'm in this outside area come fight me you look cool yeah pat kenny's running up and down steps getting getting uh fit 
And then eventually they just attack him and beat the shit out of him three on one. Yeah. What's three on one? He needs to find some Irish partners. They shove some lucky charms in his mouth. That's a good one, though. you got to admit. They tower and feather him with lucky charms. Yeah, it's good, right? Uh, I just watched all the Leprechaun movies. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, to get in tune with your culture. Thank you. I've never seen them. Uh, they're horrific. Nice. But it has the, the classic line, uh, fuck you, lucky charms. <laughs> As they kill the leprechaun. Nice. They say it in the first one, then they bring it back for one of the, for the remake with Hornswoggle in it. Oh, that's a callback. Yeah. It's a great line, to be fair. Also, first leprechaun movie. Want to know who stars in that? Who? A young Jennifer Aniston. That's a horrible role for that poor woman. Oh, she's terrible in it. It's like, is it Johnny Depp that's in the first Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, y- yes. Yes. One of those randoms like, oh, an actual famous person came from these movies. It happens every now and again. So they eventually jump back in, he has to tar and feather him with a bunch of Lucky Charms. So he's getting his ass kicked by all these people. Again, this company is just giving us bits and bits and bits for an eventual live show. <laughs> Where you're going to tar and feather me with Lucky Charms? <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the end of the show. So earlier in that show, Don West is having a chat to Desire. They're at a the park. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sonny Siak is taking care of the kids. Mm-hmm. He's playing, and uh, apparently playing too rambunctiously, because Desire chastises them for playing too high. It's dangerous. I mean... Come on, mate. It's a bloody park. Mm. Let the kids be kids. Desire talks about breaking her back. Her back exploded, but she finished the match. She's mad that then Sonny Siaki's letting the kids play. Desire wants to come back to the ring against Doctor's order to make money to feed her kids is the story here. (laughs) Where's uh, Ruddy Piper and that health insurance? Yeah, like that's literally the story. She's like, my doctors have advised me against wrestling, but I need money to feed my kids, so I guess I have no other choice. That's literally the promo. Yeah, we haven't quite got there yet. This company, she is destitute and poor. She's like Eric Watts. She's no money anymore. Yeah, we have breaking news. Go on. E3 is returning. LA 2023. Good luck to them. What it'll look like. Who has any idea? I'm just I'm just happy. I did miss the, the, the condensed nature of all of the announcements. That is fun. 100%. I, I hate digital E3. It sucks. That assumes everybody will support it again next year. I will make them. I assume they'll at least have Microsoft and Nintendo. I assume. Yeah. Did you see that Um, with New Japan's press conference, they did end one more thing? Oh, yeah. That was the crowd cheering as well, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Nintendo's legacy. Truly reaching far places that no one ever would have thought. <laughs> yes. Nintendo reaching the far off places of Japan. Who would have ever thunk it? <laughs> so Don is chatting to her and suddenly Trinity attacks her from behind Don tried to break it up but got knocked over <laughs> my favorite part is like Don tries to break it up and Trinity pushes him away then they brawl out into the grass and then Don tries to break it up again Trinity elbows him and he just tumbles down a hill mm-hmm. there's like a full backward roll as well it's very athletic <laughs> yeah, was, it, I always like outdoor stuff mm, it's just like a little bit of visual variety a little bit of like we put some more effort other than we stood in front of the interview set to do like this thing to make it look a little more interesting yeah 100% so yeah she tries to go after Desire's back before Siaki eventually makes the save yeah I, I, I honestly thought he wasn't there <laughs> <laughs> he was messing with the kids no but like I thought like they were just pretending Acting. Oh, they were like, oh, Siaki, stop it. It's because he's not there. Yeah, I, I thought like for sure they weren't there at all. Mm. So May 19th, we have a match between D-Ray 3000 and David Young. Yeah, it's nice to see D-Ray 3000. Yes, because this is a big rematch from Explosion where David Young lost to D-Ray 3000 in Explosion. But David Young claimed that it was a camera trick and he did not in fact lose. <laughs> we should also talk about David Young returning. Is, has he been gone? <laughs> Oh, in 2022! 2022! <laughs> yeah, he was in the Reverse Battle Royal. He hit a spine buster. It was cool. Yeah, it was nice to see him. Now, influence, obviously, much like Nintendo, <laughs> reaching everywhere. And we did get AMW this month as well, which did make me cry. Multiple times. I didn't, because I have no soul or heart. Cried when they returned. You should have seen me when they hit the death sentence. I was literally, like, fist pumping the air and, like, throwing things. <laughs> You, wait, you were hooting and hollering. I was hooting and hollering at like half two in the morning. You would have been removed from Kodakan Hall. They would have been like, no, you cannot do that. Go to jail. <laughs> Go to the drunk tank. And every time you protested out loud, your sentence is prolonged. Did, I bet Japanese arenas don't have drunk takes. I, I wouldn't know. 
Even though I've been there. You've been, them. You've been to them. You could find <laughs> they out. They didn't put me in one, so. You know what? Next time, I say next time as if I've ever been. We'll do a, a podcast trip to Japan, obviously, and um, I will test this theory. So that we can watch Gleet. By being belligerent. <laughs> well. I mean, if Gleet's still around. <laughs> being belligerent is no challenge for you, usually. Not usually. But I can, I can bring it to another level if I have to. So yeah, David Young wrestled D-Ray 3000. D-Ray, first time we're seeing him on the pay-per-view. The charismatic figure. Look good. Yeah, people are into the D-Ray. He has good gear. He does. So Gilberti, Swingard, Kenny brawled into the building. This distracted Young, allowing D-Ray to roll him up to continue his uh, unwinning streak. Losing streak, that's the word I'm looking for. Unwinning. His unwinning streak. The famous word for losing, unwinning. I like that this uh, David Young match was so out of the loop, like no reason, mm-hmm. that it didn't even get a best of the rest section in the broad topic well it's technically tied into the diamond and swinger and kenny stuff so very there was no mention of it but like they came out they called the finish did they yeah they rolled out they distracted david young and david young lost uh, i forgot i was just i think i was talking too much about d-ray 2000 at the time <laughs> and this is where they did the irish spring soap thing <sighs> irish pat kenny this is where they washed his mouth out with irish spring soap which, again, is a thing no Irish person has ever heard of. It's apparently big in Germany as well as America. We'll have to confer with our, our German brethren. Mm. So, yeah, that's all of the Trinity NYC desire Kenny stuff. One more to go before Liam's happy. We have Michael Shane facing Shane Douglas in their big blow-off matches. Uh, yeah, it was. they were okay. Uh, that's it. <laughs> so, first show of the month, we get a promo from Michael Shane, who's like, I have achieved all this success by myself. I don't need Tracy. I don't need franchise. I'm a man on an island. I'm doing it by myself. I won the X Division title in Ultimate X by myself. I can do it by myself again. He's not wrong. He was most successful by himself. That's true. He should have stuck to this plan. But um, it was kind of just all a, a swerve. So yeah, Franchise then cuts a promo before the match about how Tracy wasn't with him because Tracy's back with the franchise. Ah, 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 ah. Uh, he, his, his charisma is so magnetic that Tracy has returned to him. Charismatic force, the franchise. So they have a match. It's it's fine. <laughs> it's a match. Yeah, I kind of realized right now that I, I condensed these two matches into one in my mind. They just had two matches that were more or less exactly the same. I did appreciate how Franchise hit a slingshot crossbody. And he desperately wanted the validation from the crowd for that. <laughs> yeah. I, w- I wanted to give Franchise a little credit. It feels like since the Raven match, he slimmed down a little too. Mm. Perfect time to slim down when these are his last matches for five years. Well, he, he probably didn't know they were. So Tracy came out with Franchise, but it was all a giant swerve. Tracy threw a chain to Shane. God damn it, making me say chain and Shane again. <laughs> Threw a chain to Shane to beat Shane and put him in pain. But Franchise dropped Shane, stole the chain, and then won. Well. The rain in Spain falls usually in the chain with Shane. (laughs) The rain in Spain falls on Shane. Which one? You'll never know. I did kind of appreciate that Franchise just saw through their bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, he knows. They had to, like, talk to to Tracy (laughs) at some point. While she was with him, so probably deciphered it. Because, yeah, the whole thing here is they tried to swear a franchise, but he just saw through it. He, he's just like, oh, yeah, it's bu- I'm going to play along, but I know it's bullshit. It's nice that Shane got to win a two out of three <laughs> best match series on the way out. Yeah. So Tracy tried to hit franchise with her cast, but then franchise spanked her. Shane intervened. Tracy hit franchise with the cast, strapped around about his neck, and then Shane super kicked him. Until security intervened, they whipped him. This is basically the same finish as next week. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Because we have that strap involved, we have a corporal punishment match the following week between Shane Douglas and Michael Shane. Now, Liam, you might be asking, what's a corporal punishment match? It's a good question. Garrett. Yes, Liam? What the frig is a corporal punishment match? I don't even know what corporal punishment is, mate. I'm Australian. You see, it's a match where you put paddles and straps on all four ropes in the middle and then don't use them. Oh. So Michael Shane and Shane Douglas did a corporal punishment match. As I said, there's a bunch of straps and paddles tied to the four ropes, but they didn't use them. <laughs> they just did a match. I wonder if they just like forgot. They're like, I don't want to be whipped. I don't want to be paddled. Who cares? But like, come on. Michael Shane, at least you can be there to take it, you know? Mm. Also, Shane, you're winning the match. You should probably... 
So Tracy tried to interfere, but it backfired, allowing Franchise to hit a jackknife win. Franchise then kissed Tracy and went to Paddler, but Michael Shane made the save. And that's it. That's it for the franchise. That's the last time we will see him until he returns in 2009 to feud with Christopher Daniels. Seems very silly that um, he got to win twice and then leave. He's not done with the company. He does hang around. He'll be your backstage interviewer before long. So I think it's just a he's not capable of wrestling anymore kind of thing. He's not physically up to it. I don't know. He looks fine. Yeah, but you never know what's going on with somebody. Also... Put over Michael Shane then. It's so strange that not like not only did he win the first match, he won this one too. He just beat Michael Shane twice and now doesn't wrestle for five years. Like, okay, if he won the first match, fine. But it seems like the whole point of this was to set up the second match in which Michael Shane could win and then send him out of the company. Nope. Yeah, well, on to a good feud. All right, I'll let you take the Goldie and Watt stuff. Okay, so I forget what was the first week. I have to scroll up to make sure I have this in order. Because much like most of Goldilocks' segments, they kind of just jumble up in my head. So yeah, we started with the video package you want to talk about. That was on the first show of the month. Oh, the video... Okay, so we get this wonderful, wonderful video package, which actually, like, gave me audible laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> well, we had, um, Goldilocks... I mean... Okay. So is this, like... This wasn't This wasn't the, the, the phone call one. That was next week, right? No, this was the phone call one. Oh, I thought the Funko one was on the second week. So yeah, we had this great segment where Goldilocks has been repeatedly ringing <laughs> Eric Watts and complaining about Eric Watts ringing her yeah. <laughs> and saying he needs to move on, he needs to get a life. It's so sad that you would keep ringing her over and over again. But we have the timestamps on these calls and they're like a minute <laughs> from each other every time. Uh, and then eventually these two, they start going on about how it's n- it started about love, but now it's about the money. Because they actually, they aired this package twice. There was like a second condensed version of it as well. Yeah. The full one is great and you should actually try and find it. It's really funny. Yeah, it is literally just Goldilocks being as unhinged as she ever is. Just being like, Eric, leave me alone. Stop tormenting me. Eric, I hate you. Why are you obsessed with me? I'm not crazy. You're crazy. And then it's like, received at 3.43. Received at 3.45. <laughs> Just randing it for Eric Watts. We also got a video package recounting all of her racist kicks. <laughs> so, you know, it was it was a big big one heading into this uh, Abyss Eric Watts match. Of course, we have um, Watts. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, a poor man now. He lost his TNA job. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's not making not making bank anymore. I like um, downtrodden working man Eric Watts now with his new gear. He lost the suits. Now he's got the button up and the jeans. <laughs> Not even a button up at times. Sometimes it's just a t-shirt. Yeah. Poor guys hit hard times, daddy. He should t- he should join uh, American Dreams Most Wanted. No, he should join uh, Desire as a quest to make some money because that's what the only reason they're here. Yeah, well, he's working for TNA now and that's enough for Desire to put food on the table, so... Should be enough for Eric Watts. Maybe Eric Watts just says... I'll, I'll do the, the, the rich people talking about millennials nowadays where it's like... Uh, maybe they should just cut out all of those expenditures, like eating and power. Yeah, they shouldn't have the internet. They're always on their phones, Liam. Oh, they're all eating their avocado. That was a big one in Australia. I don't know if that made it out uh, elsewhere. I think that was an American thing as well, but not here. It was a oh, all of these millennials too busy buying avocado to pay their rent. They're like, I have a choice this month whether I'm going to eat avocados or pay my rent and frankly i've chosen the avocados it's a, it's it's so funny like that kind of reporting because it's like millennials aren't buying houses and then it's like it's like oh millennials entitled to their houses that they want to buy <laughs> <sighs> so then we had eric watts against the best i thought it was fun and uh, watts is in pretty good shape what's his what's his moving he's in happy to have his shirt taken off shape which is good for you watts yeah proud of you looking good I'm enjoying the Abyss and Eric Watts stuff, and it's funny that we've kind of had this uh, consistent theme between these two, because we also had it with the Kid Cash stuff. Mm. So Watts was running wild, grabbed a baseball bat, Goldie came out, tried to take the baseball bat from Watts. The distraction allowed Abyss to hit a black hole slam and win. Yeah. Goldie then grabbed a microphone and said she enjoys seeing Watts flat on his back, just like she left him. Yeah, yeah. Shoved some, shoved a dollar down his throat. She is very frugal. She's very smart. I always get really confused when I see how easily... American money crumples, and I remember it's like shitty paper. Oh yeah, it's literal paper. <laughs> yeah, that seems awful. Your money would get like destroyed. To be fair, ours isn't much better. <laughs> the Euro notes. Ours is like plastic. Yeah, you have that fancy like durable money. <laughs> yeah, 
That's not, that's not like a, a crazy thing. <laughs> that seems like that should be the norm. No, you're crazy. Don't call me crazy. You call me crazy. Hey, Don. Donald. Vincent Russo. Michael Tanay. Does she say Michael? She probably should. She hits Donald and she hits Vincent. Because mm. she says that Abyss wants the next shot at the, the NWA title. Yeah, Abyss choked Watts until security came out. Abyss then killed the security. He's the original Wardlow. Then Watts eventually made his own comeback, ran Abyss off with the bat. They should be teaming up. Should be pals. They should just turn on Goldie. What a destructive force. Like, Goldie, you're out of here. No, Goldie should join back up with Eric Watts. True chaos. Uh, so Goldie is doing a promo. She's mad that Watts got his job back. She's talked to Adrian, Carmen, and Kate. Yes, even Kate. And they all agree that this is a crime. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. And then she threatens a nasty legal battle. And is like, I have the money. She has gotten all of Eric Watts' money somehow. I, I think that's the story. I'm not sure. Well, she got Eric Watts' money. And then she, I think she got Don, not Don West. Uh, Don Callis' money as well? Yeah, she's been just stealing money from everybody. Mm. I believe Adrian, Carmen, and Kate were meant to be the names of her alternate characters. <laughs> oh. Who was Adrian? I don't know. Maybe that was that one that was meant to be Asian that we were like, what? <laughs> that was just her in a black wig. <laughs> uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. So then, last show of the month, they confront Mike Tanay and Don West. Donald? <laughs> she shouts at them. She's like, I have a legal dispute and I have all this money. And she has like $4 in her hand. <laughs> They're $1 notes. That would make sense if like, that's the reason she looks so raggedy at the same time. Like she looks as bad as Eric Watts does. <laughs> they're just all, like, again, they're toxic for each other in every way. I've seen legitimate relationships like this. <laughs> <laughs> that even when they break up, they're still hideous for each other. Without the like, physical aspect mm. that like Eric Watts is getting cheered every three seconds for trying to choke slam <laughs> Goldie Lux. of course <laughs> but like the constant like shit talking each other while also both being in basically the exact same position is something I have definitely seen in real life yeah so that she's shouting at Tanae and West Don West then says she's crazy and she's like crazy would a crazy person do this? You calling me crazy, Donald? And he wants to say yes so badly. He wants to say yes so badly. Not only does he want to say yes so badly, he leads the crowd in crazy chants. <laughs> and I love Tanae's faces in the background. Some great Tanae faces. Oh, Tanae faces are the best part of these shows. This has been one of the best feuds in TNA history. <laughs> so Watts shows up, rolls of the abyss, throws abyss into a chair in the corner, falls with a bat shot. Then he stepped on Goldilocks's hand as she tried to retrieve her four dollars. <laughs> well, clearly they both need it. <laughs> they really do. I was being earnest when I said that, that by the way. <laughs> I think you'll be upset about this note, but Abyss was told a few weeks ago that he was going to be a background player until the FSN show starts. He was assured that he will be involved in a big feud once the show starts. Well, they, uh, well that doesn't make any sense. He's in the biggest yeah, feud. I was like, you, you surely wouldn't be able to comprehend this. Garrett, if this feud continues into the next month, which God do I hope it does... It better not be in the best of the rest. <laughs> it's the headline topic. I don't need to be the headline, but it's not the best of the rest. Usually best of the rest is less uh, a, a denotion of importance and more just... Garrett, do it. <laughs> more a denotion of like the amount Give of Give it content. its own topic. It's usually when it's only like a small amount of things happened with a thing, it gets thrown as a best Could of the rest. Could you please make a new one called best of the best and put that in there? Okay, we'll do that next month. Wow. This is a this is some good content for the one dollar tier. Yes, you can look at the show notes on the one dollar tier. Yeah. See, I don't have to pay for it, so I don't know. Though I've realized, you know, when you do like size gimmicks and color gimmicks, do yeah. doesn't actually come through on Patreon, so <laughs> they don't see that. I mean, that's more just to honestly, I do the color gimmick so that I know how long the show is left. <laughs> So, very quickly, show by show, NWA TNA BBB number 83, May 5th, 2004. I enjoyed during the Team Canada against Team USA match that they got to some troops in the crowd. The troops? Shouting USA. Mm, they're super into the America. Uh, makes sense, I suppose. I like the, the new approach they have to, like, the pre-match features, that they're not just recaps. They actually include new promos in there sometimes now. Yeah. There was a really cool one on the last show, which was, like, uh, Dallas and Kid Cash in some purple and green hellscape. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. I, I like the idea of it's not just recap content. They throw like a little bit of new stuff in there. Well, we saw some of that in the opening stuff earlier too, because we got like the, that, great, that great James Mitchell promo mm. in one of the last week recaps. I think it's, it's a good approach to make stuff like that less skippable. Yeah. 
I still will. Hmm. You can't force me. Don West called Goldilocks a psycho woman. <laughs> Donald's gonna have to fucking square up to me in a minute. I swear to God, talking shit about my girl Goldilocks like this. Mm. Do you have anything to say about uh, that show? Um, no. It- NWT and favorite number 94. I got no, no notes from this. I assume you don't. Uh, ooh, let me look. Let me look. Uh, look at it. Uh, uh, well, did we, you didn't talk about the Tanae Russo sit down. Yeah, it was pretty basic. He was like, you like AJ. And then he's like, no, I don't. He's defending the belt every week and I prefer him not to. And it's like, you hate Kona. I was like, no, I don't. We're friends. <laughs> and then he explained his, in fact, genius approach of his keeping people away from ringside by having them at ringside. <laughs> oh, we have the Conan story. Oh, that, yeah, apparently he's on the way out this month. He thinks he's WWE bound, but obviously that doesn't happen. I would have loved to have seen Conan in this era of uh, WWE. I think it would have been a good fit. Yeah, Conan was scheduled to be at both the tapings and TV this week. He said goodbyes last week to some of his friends in the company, saying that he was going to WWE. He's not gotten his release, though, and due to tampering laws, WWE will not negotiate with him until he gets his release. That's embarrassing. It's like, they're real contracts, much as he may hate them. <laughs> I'm like, M-O-W. Mm. That was, that was on the uh, May 19th show, which is the show we did for the watch along, teenagead.com, patreon.com slash getting me if you'd like to hear our extensive thoughts on that show. Zombiewcw.com. Yes, do I do that is one you can go to. God, I pay for URLs. It's a good bit, though. Mm. It's the sign of a good podcast. And then last show of the month, uh, May 26th, is the World X Cup show. I forgot to mention, I mentioned that Hijikata and Abysmal did the Shattered Dream spots, and then Abysmal completely no-sold it. <laughs> but then they did it again in the tag match, and Abysmal sold it that time. Oh, Garrett. Yes. I have a, a domain name that's currently available. Uh, go on. What if I told you TNAMecca.com was available? I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> that is one I simply do not want to own, even as a bit. It's only $2,000. Oh. No. <laughs> oh. 1895 400 Patreons. <laughs> <laughs> Buy TNAMecca.com. <laughs> It'd be a good bit. Think of all of the evergreen content from people linking to TNAMecca.com that we could get. Mm, so yeah, 100 patrons will do All Wheels Wrestling. 400 patrons will do. It is $72 a month, so you will need to cover that with the Patreon. Uh, I, I, they I constructed the Ultimate X a little differently, because I thought, one, it was set, it felt a little lower this time. Well, because they were doing more jumping from person up stuff. Mm. So maybe that was intentional. And also, they hung the X above it as opposed to hanging it from the cable, which was interesting. Yeah. All right, that is May 2006. We'll be back in June, which is a pretty monumental month in TNA history. We have major debuts. We have the debut of King of the Mountain. And of course, we have the debut of the Impact Television Show and lots and lots of content. I'm a content fiend, but generally for good content. (laughs) So again, uh, we will request your patience. I know we're not always the best about getting episodes out every two weeks anyway, but for the next couple months, it might be a little rough for a little while. We'll do our best. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Kazuki Takahashi, passed away. We talked about it off air. I'll talk about it on air, because you guys great, and uh, we talk about it a lot. Yeah. It's died in a, what was it, scuba diving? Yeah, scu- uh, dead man in snorkeling gear was found floating off the coast of Nago, Okinawa on July 8th, and authorities identified him as Takahashi the following day. Crazy. That's the reason I don't trust the ocean. Uh, the ocean's terrifying, and no one should ever go in it. Damn right. We should actually be spending most of our time uh, removing the ocean. <laughs> Team Magma, baby. That's the main reason global warming is bad. It's like, sea levels are rising means there's more ocean. <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with, like, what it's doing. Just that it's happening, and there's more. Just of it. the amount of ocean there is. It's too much. So yes, we'll be back in two weeks with the June 2004 episode, which, as I said, it'll be a pretty big one—the debut of the Impact Television Show. We'll be back in a week with the next episode of Global Force Wrestling. We'll be back on the 17th of July with the next episode of Rain Takers, covering the Kazuna Road Show. All of that you can get and more at tnhad.com or patreoncom slash me. You can follow us on Twitter at TNA History Pod. You can follow me on Twitter at Garrett Kidney. You can follow Liam on Twitter at the Gleet Muda. Thanks for listening, and bye bye. Do the Dan thing? We're still being family, right? We still yeah. can't say damn. Damn. <gasps>